good old union has come in here to dwell. Which side are you on? Which side are you on? My daddy was a miner and I'm a miner's son. And I'll stick with the union till every battle's won. Which side are you on? Which side are you on? They say in Harlan County there are no neutrals there. You'll either be a union man or a thug for J.H. Blair. Which side are you on? Which side are you on? It were 1920. In the southwest field and things was tough. The miners was trying to bring the union to West Virginia, and the coal operators and their gun thugs was set on keeping them out. Them was hard people, your coal miners then. They wasn't nobody who wanted to cross. So push come to shove, and pretty soon we had us a war down there in Mingo County, which in them days was known as Bloody Mingo. And that's where it all come to a head, there on Tug Fork, in the town of Matewan. Okay, welcome to Movie Night Extravaganza, episode 54. We're talking about Mate One, uh, you know, John Sayles' film, and about labor history and film and uh, the way that, you know, labor and unions have been betrayed. Um, I'm sure that that'll be the tail end of the conversation and less than, you know, less that part than, than actually talking through this movie. Because, I mean, I didn't write any notes down about that. But um, uh, I am here with... Jay Underworld, graphic designer extraordinaire, movie night extravaganza co-host, Ben Burgess, uh, co- well, I guess it's not co-host, but it's... Uh, loyalist? Loyalist. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well done. Well done. Yes. Artist. Ben Burgess, artist. Artiste. Uh, <laughs> um, Conan Neutron of Protonic Reversal, co-host of this podcast, and also Conan Neutron and the Secret Friends. And we are joined... Um, you know, once again by C. Derek Varn, who hasn't been on the show for quite some time. Um, we were talking in, in a little bit of early a different season direction, one, but what? <laughs> Not since early season one. Yeah, but uh, frequent guest for the first twenty episodes of of the show, and then and then we got a little too big for him, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> or he got too big for us, one way or the yeah, other. Yeah, one or the other. I don't know. The, the lines never the lines never crossed again. <laughs> Um, and of course, Sean KB from the Antifada. Um, Hi, how's it going? Good, happy to be with you guys. Bringing that big Jesus energy to the labor organization. Yeah, I appreciate that. yeah. I already bring it to the job site. I might as well bring it here. <laughs> big Jesus E, <laughs> we call it. It's different than Big Jesus D. That's another. That's a, that's, yeah, that's, that's, very that's for after hours, my friend. You don't bring that one to the job site. Leave that at right, all. Exactly. That's that's not work appropriate. You can no. get in trouble for that one. <laughs> Jesus did. We canceled him. <laughs> anyway, um, what do you so, think the crucifixion was? Yeah. Oh, hey. It was a Prince Albert. <laughs> oh. We get right so to the heart of the matter already. I love it. <laughs> one of one of my one of my first questions going into this. Um, I think that this history, I mean, both Mate One as this battle and you know the other skirmishes around it, 
uh, the Battle of Blair Mountain, which is what all of this kind of culminated into, has all kind of been, I think, buried from history. And I mean, I, I think, you know, most people at this point have read like Howard Zinn and he kind of uh, touch like barely touches on it when describing kind of the process of, um, you know, labor, labor uprisings that led to kind of a, a compromise with the New Deal. Um, but I don't, besides that, like, I don't think I've heard this history really covered until, you know, watching this movie and, and, you know, listening to podcasts and stuff, but like not in any kind of mainstream or like, you know, uh, news source or like, even like something like NPR, I've never, you know what I mean? Like that, that's those like, oh, look, quirky moments in history or something. You know what I mean? Like, this is like the equivalent of a second civil war, you know, like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah and there, there's a long history of it too if you actually go back starting in like the 1880s with the recession uh then and uh the the they were like stealing car uh train cars and uh the marines were chasing them across the country you know just wild stuff but um again all buried well, yeah, I mean, the only one we're talking about. Oh, sorry, Martin. Uh, the only one we're talking about is like Thomas Frank, right? He likes talking about the Wobblies mm. and stuff like that. But other than that, anyway, yeah, Varn, hit it. Go ahead. Well, I mean, the, we always talk about Debs, for example, from like 1920, but this is how he actually got his place and his respectability. Um, he kind of dropped well, the ball on this one. On, yeah, he on... did, actually. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, how bad this was, I mean, it is like, largely not covered this is the largest insurrection in the united states history other than the civil war um there's at least 10 at least ten thousand miners were involved and three thousand um law people and um uh, uh baldwin uh baldwin felt's men um and even this movie as much as i love it only covers the beginning and the sexy part like at the end of the battle of blair mountain you have like the federal either the federal the state government literally bombing the mountain mm. i mean yeah. it's it, it it gets insane um, and they still they still are now that i mean you know they're still mm -hmm. going in there trying to destroy the historical site that they've built around um like within the last couple of years they didn't want the hundred the hundred hundredth anniversary of the battle which i think was last year it was like mm -hmm. 1921 um the hundredth anniversary, they didn't want that celebrated, and they were going in there trying to literally blow the mountaintops off of Blair Mountain. In terms of how this is, uh, you know, this this film portrays it versus the the regular ass American history we get in school or we get on the History Channel or PBS or whatever. Uh, this story, um, we'll, we'll get labor history in the United States to an extent. Uh, you'll maybe get a homestead, you get a Pullman strike. But really, the um, the main history starts at uh, with the New Deal, essentially, because what the New Deal did was manage to integrate um, these sort of class contradictions and uh, whatever into the state and into the political economy. But before that, and this movie, I think, is really good at portraying it. It was literally the Wild West. You know, this wasn't just you know the cops or the National Guard, although they would often come in. This was private power on private power. You know, this yeah. is um, where equal rights prevail, uh, rule rule decides, right? Or um, what is the Marx quote? Where where equal right meets equal right, um, force decides. Force decides exactly. This this is this is the situation, and so that's the first like half of American labor history right there, and it yeah. it, it can't be talked about because it's very it's very um, frightening and very contradictory towards what this country is supposed to be. Right. I mean. It, it is no it is no accident that the Baldwin Feltz men are not really dissolved until 1936, which is, um, you know, when basically the New Deal incorporates uh, la labor unions into the Democratic Party apparatus enough that they feel like they don't need um, uh, basically an armed paramilitary um, of either the Baldwin right. Feltz or the Pinkertons to take them out in any given moment. Which, by the way, Pinkertons are still around today. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know what they're doing now, the Pinkertons? You, you got to love this. A lot of what they do is not just corporate security, but uh, helping create like evacuation plans for various capitalists. Uh, you know, if an insurrection were to pop up or some sort of flood or whatever, the Pinkertons will be there to like scoop you up, you know, scoop up Bezos in a helicopter and fly him to a secure <laughs> bunker. Yeah. So they're still working directly for capital at this late day, just in maybe different ways. Just like well, uh, G or Blackwater does too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. So, so, and I, if I can just interject here, the it's also just notable to see how it, how it's covered. Because first of all, we just don't cover labor period in this country at all. Like, there's just you would think it never existed. 
that uh, you know unless you like are from like a labor family or something like i am like my dad's a lifelong uh, union electrician so i knew all about it you know from early age good bad and the ugly but like look at like even like the wikipedia article for the the matewan massacre right it like calls it the battle of matewan like it, like there's such you know the articulation and framing of the language is done like in such a way to be like quote unquote neutral so as to make it just sound like something that was not what it was and I think that's something that's really interesting. And I think it's pretty bold for sales to, uh, who's a pretty bold guy, frankly, to make a yeah. movie about this. Cause people weren't looking for this, to be clear. No. People were not <laughs> like, hey, sure it'd be great if we had a movie about that massacre of, of all the labor people. In 1987, like right? Like we gotta <laughs> yeah. put that in context. I, this is I, Reagan's I, America, no uh, one was looking for it. I was trying I, uh, to think I have about- a clip. I have a yeah, clip putting ahead. it into context. I mean, uh, Sean, you can, I mean, before we could, before we play the clip, you can, uh, I, I just, I have a clip uh, putting into context why sales chose to make this film at this time. Oh, Perfect. cool. Perfect, awesome. yeah. That's all I was awesome. going to talk about. Go ahead. It was just as hard to make as any independent movie. So, you know, it wasn't what it was about. It was that we were trying to make a movie outside of the, you know, the studio system um, to the point where we thought we had the money when we thought we could make it for a little under $2 million. And then the people who said they were going to put up the money called and said, Oh, you know, that bank loan we were going to get to finance them. It didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And so a year and a half to two years later, we finally did make it for about twice that much money, which just our luck was when independent movies, there were distributors who actually put money up front for movies. And I put some money in and we had some other people, you know, independently put some money in and, and I think we made it for about three and a half, a little more than three and a half million dollars. Mm -hmm. So the subject matter wasn't what was hard. It was just making a fairly ambitious movie, mm -hmm. you know, outside of a, of a system where, you know, Chris Cooper, who was the lead in it had never been in a movie before. Um, and that was the good thing about it, which is that, you know, making a movie that far on the, the, you know, the margins of things, you didn't have to say, well, who's bankable? You know, he wasn't even recognizable, much less bankable. <laughs> yeah. um, why, why making it then? It was a, the Matewan massacre was an incident that I had heard about first uh, when I was hitchhiking um, through the West Virginia and Kentucky Hills and got a lot of rides from coal miners right during this kind of awful thing that happened within the UMW where there was going to be an election. And Tony Boyle, who was the incumbent, um, was running against a reformer named Jockey Oblonsky. And it was really bitter and there was a lot of violence and stuff and people were just kind of shaking their heads and saying, well, we're gonna have another Matewan massacre mm -hmm. on our hands. And eventually um, Tony Boyle had um, Jackie Blonsky and his wife and daughter murdered. Murdered, yeah, so in their home. Um, and that didn't turn out well. In Harlan County, USA. I in think Harlan. that's a, a serious um, yeah. plot point in that documentary, yeah. if anybody's seen it. And uh, and at the same time, I, 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 you know, having having been in some unions, having grown up around unions in Schenectady, New York, back when the General Electric Company pretty much you know, was the main employer there before they went elsewhere. Um, I, I kind of knew of the, a bit about labor history, but also um, the first thing that Ronald Reagan did really almost just to do it and, and lift his leg on the thing um, when he got into office was bust the air traffic controllers union. And kind of, he picked that union, I think, or his advisors picked it wisely and that those people made pretty good money People didn't think they were kind of poor working stiffs who had to punch in every day. Um, the fact was almost everybody in that union did not get their jobs back. Um, and that within about a year of the new people coming in, they got almost everything that those people were, were asking for. So it was very symbolic. I'm just going to screw this union kind of thing. And I felt like, you oh. there were fewer and fewer people who were unionized. I wasn't about four guilds in the entertainment industry at the time, but I just felt like oh, maybe we need a reminder of just what it was like when there weren't any unions and, and why they formed and how difficult it was to form them. Oh yeah. Let's, let's also put it in context. The last movie he did before this was the brother from another planet. 
which is awesome, but like it's is basically film. from another planet compared <laughs> to this film, right? I never saw that. No, yeah, it's, it's I, good. Watch it. It's it's really good. Okay. Yeah. Next next movie night extravaganza. I, 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 love it. I love yeah. it. And we should also do Lone Star at some point too, because that one also is, is fantastic. But anyway, let's stay on task. But he's got he's got uh he's got kind of low key uh Jesse Ventura energy. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah, so I, I think that that's definitely first of all, as as you said, Conan, take a drink. Take it's a Ron drink, Reagan. Reagan. Friend of show, um, <laughs> we talked to him. We talked to him through the seance machine. Um, <laughs> but um, it's on the way back machine uh, on uh, archive.org if you're wondering. Yeah, it's actually easier to contact Nancy and then because Nancy's the big you know seance astrologer person. Oh yeah, but that's right. I forgot about yeah, that. Yeah, and she'll she'll hook you up with uh, with Ronnie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she'll make the connect. Yeah, he still somehow he still has Alzheimer's though. Um, in you know, he still in, has hell. in in hell, which is weird. he's like the first person to ever get. Uh, yeah, on set, it's never uh, happened how, before. Time. Most people get cured when they go down there, but not Ron. It's, it's never happened before, or everyone forgot about it. One or the other. <laughs> hey, everybody, a little Alzheimer's team. Biden might be the second one to get. Uh, ah, you know, uh, Thatcher game. too. Thatcher famously died with uh, Alzheimer as well. There's got to there's got to be some weird like connection between like neoliberalism and Alzheimer's, where it's <laughs> yeah. like the more neoliberal you are, like the higher your chances are of just your brain because you're not using your, your brain well enough. Yeah. <laughs> Just like how being like a right wing far right operative turns you into Gollum, like, like, so like, like, like corrupts everyone. So it's like, wow, that dude's thirty two. Good lord! It's, it's Paul Rove is paging. Um. So yeah, I think that that's first of all, like it is. It is this big moment. I mean, when you hear anybody kind of talk about his like the history of the Reagan years, like Showtime did that uh, Reagan's documentary, which I think was. I mean, it was pretty good. I, I don't necessarily think it had. Um, like analysis past the point of kind of a liberal like Reagan gutted the welfare state. This is how bad things got. You know the AIDS crisis, like that kind yeah, of. They, like, they let the AIDS was killing the right people, so like they let it yeah. happen. Like maybe wasn't explicitly stated or framed the way I would have liked it, but. So so, but that was like a good documentary series, and it does touch on the fact that kind of um you know the first thing that Reagan really does is crush this union. Like that, that's the first kind of signal that he's going. Yeah, the air traffic problem. controllers. Yeah. A very that's the just language. arrived in prison take down the biggest dude right uh, yeah. Reagan did. and and they had yes. and they had supported him that the uh air traffic controllers because uh carter had been so bad on on labor and and workers rights like you know with all the strikes that had happened uh which is kind of like the last gasp i guess of this of this labor activity um you know as the democratic party ran as far away from them as possible and tried to grab kind of this uh more professional professional managerial kind of uh you know pmc type of person i mean i know varn hates that you know it's not necessarily a class i know we've had the, the, this conversation a bunch of times but that kind of person i think that kind of elite um you know professional is is kind of who the democratic party is grabbing for during this time period and realizing that they no longer kind of need uh anybody in the in the labor movement so i they they, they start trying to actively distance themselves from labor which turns into the dlc in the 90s and turns into third way and all that you know, i like to, here. i like to think of that story i like to complicate that story a little bit because i don't think it was simply a political choice on the part of the Maybe. democrats you had the entire sort of new deal post-war consensus uh goes into deep systemic structural crisis in the 1970s and so not only are the democrats moving away from labor by the time you know carter his president, but also labor, our workers are running away from the Democratic Party and also running away from the unions as well. The 1970s right. was yeah. famously, you know, the, the last huge strike wave that we had. And it was not completely, but it was it was often a wildcat strike wave. Yeah, because you had this entire sort of edifice that we mentioned before, when we were talking about uh, integrating the, the working class, integrating the unions into not just the Democratic Party, but also into American legal and political structures. That was starting to break down in the 1970s. So, you know, yeah, uh, because the leadership yeah. of the seven, you know, in the 70s went through the uh, uh, the McCarthy era, you know, uh, getting getting purged and whatnot, um, uh, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, with the, with the Red Scare. So, yeah. Uh, well, and it's then, also harder to and then the leadership the franchise shop. The, the leadership was like supporting, um, you know, the war in Vietnam. So, so like, you know, in the sixties, so, so by the time seventies rolled around, the leadership just wasn't there. Like it used to be. Yeah. Well, oh, Barn, go ahead. No, I, I, I just, I, I totally agree with all that, but I just, I, I like Sean think that there are larger, there are larger economic forces that were driving a lot of this. And what we're really looking at is the epiphenomena of it. 
Um, and I, I don't think we can under underplay how big a deal uh, like the end of the, the, the middle period of the new deal was for getting labor. I mean, the national labor relations board pretty much makes unions um, subject to regulations in such a way that like, Solidarity strikes are effectively illegal. Coming together, as, uh, forming political parties. Dual cardism is effectively illegal. Like everything that have built labor parties in the 19th and early 20th century in Europe, even in Israel, uh, the Democrats and the Republicans jointly put a squash on in the 40s and 50s. Um, and then you had the AFL-CIO with the AFL purging all the communists out, out of the unions. But that, like you said, during the McCarthy period... Um, but there's also the profitability crisis in the 70s. Yeah. I mean, it's actually interesting because it's very similar to the 1920s, which is like the beginnings of a real profitability squeeze, too, which is why the conditions in these mines and these labor camps get so bad. You see a brief uptick in profitability in the mid 20s, and then the Great Depression happens. Yeah. And there's, I mean, I don't know. There's a lot of different parts of stuff, like the fact that kind of the '70s are the decade of like not being able to trust anything, right? Like, mm -hmm. it, there's a long, there's a long time where the intelligence state has kind of gone around and just, you know, assassinated, murdered, destroyed whoever they want, and and that's kind of being uncovered in the '70s. At the same time as Watergate, at the same time as, um, you know, I mean, like a, a the fall couple, of Saigon. Like, yeah, and and a decade before that, you know, uh, Bobby Kennedy going around and 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 kind of doing this. Um, well, I'm going to hold mafia people accountable. And throughout that process, it comes out, you know what I mean? Like that, uh, all the stuff like Jimmy Hoffa and like, you know, so that all of that kind of at the same time um, makes it so that, you know, any kind of organizational structure on one hand, corruption being shedded or, you know what I mean? Like th these things are being exposed. People feel more informed. But when there are actual organizational efforts that require um, like a, a structure to be in place for people to get more benefits, they're running away from that into this like individualism. And it's a cultural shift. It's like, you know, we can't trust anything. Vietnam happened. We can't trust the government. They're going to send us, you know, into Vietnam. Like this is, and we can't trust the you know, labor unions. Everything's corrupt. Yeah, the hard hat, you know, riot happened yeah. where, where yeah. they uh, um, were attacked the hippies. Those um, are my people. You know? Yeah, your people were attacked. Your people. Woo, carpenters go. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and <laughs> you, you know, like, people I, who look like you. Yes, exactly. and, and I think who that's think so like important. I do. <laughs> it's, it's, well, I think it's so important to remember, right? Because people think of like labor as, as uh, you know, being like this this utopian idea of, of what uh, unions should be. But I'm really glad that in the movie you have James Earl Jones' character that is, let's just go ahead and charitably say, not looked upon favorably when he like comes in to uh, talk to them about joining up. In fact, it's like pretty overtly racist. But that tracks because even uh, more recently, right? You know, like like think about the, na the nationalistic uh, sentiments coming from. Uh, auto workers and whatnot during like the, during the 80s when like the foreign cars were, were coming in stuff like that like it got pretty ugly and i like that it was addressed but it wasn't like the main focus like the idea is like nobody overcome this and i think that's important to tell because people don't want to tell that story sometimes like no you yeah. should tell it because it shows you that like you can overcome it and there is more power uh being together well, this was a class reductionist yeah. this film was class <laughs> reductionist it did not do intersectionality <laughs> well yeah, there was, there was i no heard growth. i heard uh i heard uh adolf reed actually you know edited the script down in a, in, in a bigger <laughs> cave and, and the bread and more female offices. pinkertons yeah <laughs> that's a, but it's an interesting point when you look at the uh, appalachian labor history the south never unionized union by the time the south was able to begin to do so um uh, they were able to use um black strike uh strike breakers and scabs consistently which also accelerated labor tensions and when the wobblies and stuff gave up after the battle for blair mountain a lot of those workers went directly into the clan um yeah uh, w.e.d du bois talks about this explicitly so it's it's one of those things where there's a feedback loop here. Um, and it's also an interesting factoid. In the 1920s and 30s, the average white worker um, in the South made less than the average black worker in the North. And we don't even want to talk about what the average black worker in the South made, which was pretty much nothing. Um, and, and the reason why was they were able to use this, um, this strategy pretty effectively 
um, Barry Mountain's one of the times where they did overcome it. Yeah. And um, which which is interesting. I mean, it's West Virginia that wasn't kind of uh, you know that broke away from the Confederacy. And but the reason that they broke away from the Confederacy and that they were able to kind of um, like in other in other parts of the country, right? There's a lot of strike action that isn't necessarily seen as as like as as dehumanizing, I guess, or the, the workers involved are not as dehumanized as they are in West Virginia. Like the, the way that workers are treated in West Virginia still kind of is almost like these are backwards hillbillies. They're not worth anything to anybody. You know, like um, I was listening to Revolutionary Left Radio today and they did a, hey, a three hour hours. episode of, of uh, they did a three hour episode on the Battle of Blair Mountain. And I, I was like, you know, I was walking around and, and listening to it. And, and it's just it's crazy. You know, Sid Hatfield, who's the, the cop in this, you know, in this movie, but also was kind of the the hero, the hero that was birthed from uh, Matt one, which which like, you know, you don't necessarily get you don't necessarily get like the mate one um, like, uh, you know, that that image from the end of it, because at the end, they're like, oh, and then he died on the on the on the steps of the, uh, you know, of the courthouse. But like that was a huge event. That was a huge event, not just for uh, West Virginia miners, but it was a huge event for kind of workers across the country who were like, oh, shit, this guy just got gunned down on the fucking steps of, of a courthouse and nobody did anything about it. He was going into court and like they were just like, hey, like it's a mafia hit pretty much. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that was a huge thing. And they were talking about on Revolutionary Left Radio how um, the, the the thing was that like uh, the, the New York Times came out and said, yeah, well, this is because he he lived by the sword. He died by the sword. Like. This is just, you know, kind of like a backwards redneck that, you know, everybody down there is killing each other and there's no real reason behind it. And, you know, this is just what yeah, he was asking for. The Hatfield and McCoy uh, wars, which yeah, is kind of right, created that yeah. stereotype. Fall into the I, archetypes. Yeah. I don't know if he's related to... to those Hatfields. Uh, adopted um, by. Yeah, mm. he's okay. adopted into it. Yeah, yeah I, I, I meant to look it up, but I found a fantastic um, hour-long thing from somebody from West Virginia covering this with, like, all the court records reconstructed from from a couple different sources well, i didn't find that i wish i had found that <laughs> yeah it was, it was really good um i'll uh, i'll dig that back up and, and send you a link one of the really interesting things i thought of when i saw this movie is how um site specific um the, the the set is like so like the context of it is um mm. the backwards mm. backwards underdeveloped uh, hill country of west virginia uh in the in the 1920s um and one thing I think that is interesting is is how like this extractive capital operates differently from say like industrial capital, right? Right. So what you're what one of the reasons why in in the very beginning of the movie there's that really incredible scene where they're talking about uh, the history of the IWW and they're talking about Joe Hill, they're talking about Big Bill Haywood, um, the 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 miners union was like was very militant and also connected with the IWW, and the reason for that is that this wasn't this was a different proletariat in a sense there's a different phase of proletarian development all the way up until the new deal era as well where talking about itinerant work you know going from the forests and, and being a lumberjack during the fall going to do uh mine work in the winter and then going to pick crops uh in the springtime maybe going to do longshore work in the summer there was like a large part of the american working class who was itinerant essentially like newly proletarianized workers uh, yeah. to which like the IWW was a form that kind of organically rises from that. And when you're talking about a place like Blair Mountain and the militancy of that, it's because A, these people are wage laborers for like maybe the first, maybe second generation, right? So this is a new sort of like historical experience. But also too, it was literally the Wild West because like you didn't have big factories. You're talking about capital like going into with railroads, like inserting itself, like driving itself through the mountains in order to like basically infiltrate and profit from and exploit uh, these people who had up until then been very, very, very uh, isolated. It's a very unique and interesting experience. And it kind of it kind of still exists, I guess, but kind of doesn't. Yeah, I mean, if you think about, there's some corollaries to it to in the developing world. There's still extracted capital in, in right. Appalachia today, um, but the coal mines aren't nearly as important. Uh, out here in the Mountain West, we also have a lot of extracted capital, and it works somewhat similarly. But yeah, I mean, the, one thing we got to remember is even the even the uh, the the non-immigrant labor is they've been sharecroppers for. Um, for probably the first hundred years that they've been in the on this continent, 
Um, they're Scotch Irish. Most of them, a lot of them, came over as indentured servants. Um, these people have been the low end of the of the U.S. class totem pole the entire time. And we also have to think about regional industrialization because the South and the West were not industrialized yet. The South yeah. wouldn't be industrialized till the fucking 1950s. Mm-hmm. Like it's wild, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, and you and you see in, in this, I mean, in this movie specifically, um, like bringing it back to this, you see like the they're living in feudal conditions, like and the feudal conditions kind of come to them in the fact that maybe you own land at some point and, you know, uh, like more land. Right. Because this is kind of a rural, a rural um, isolated area, like before they kind of discovered, hey, we can really mine and like extract as much coal as fucking possible from this region specifically. Like you had people that maybe owned some land and came in and either, uh, you know, someone someone realized how much coal there was. And so I guess some of the people that were investing in this were even in England. Like, you know what I mean? Like they, they were in places that were so far away and so far removed from the actual place itself. They would have people come in and say either uh, we this is our land now. Like you there's no deed to this land. This is our land and this is the deed. The government has given us a deed. Or they would kind of buy it out at a really, really, really low price, right? And if you have all this land and you're like, well, I mean, it's almost like kind of um, fracking. I mean, no, but it's almost like kind of a, a almost kind of in, an indigenous way of looking at land stuff, right? Like mm-hmm. people in, in rural communities that are that isolated, it's kind of like you have a bunch of land and someone and someone can come in and use the apparatus of a, a, like a state agency to or like a corporate agency to just say, no, we own this land after you kind of just had the land with your, you know, with your family. Yeah, maybe the, maybe like, you like yeah. hunt small game on it or something, but you're not yeah. really using it all that much. And then they're coming in and waving money around. Yeah. And, you, and you hit on an important point for us that I think that one thing I really like in the movie is it, it like at the, at the outset, it talks about like, you'll be paid in company scrip. You can yeah. buy this at the company's store. The idea being that even when they're ostensibly paying these workers, like whatever pittance that they're paying them, it remains in the system, which isn't really that much different than like, you know, Facebook and Google, where the, the whole thing is designed to like keep you within those mm-hmm. organization and keep like that that resources flowing back to the organization. Well, they've been floating, they've been floating the Mars. idea of uh, of some of these tech companies creating company towns again in the same system where it's like i mean they're to, almost yeah. there like a, fr- a friend of mine i don't want to narc him out but a friend of mine like had me go uh like just, hey do you want to see you know where i work and it was one of these big tech places and, and they, it was and, and it they, was hold on hold on this is, the idea. It's, it's gonna take like it's gonna take yeah, two yeah. more seconds for me to okay, finish okay. this it was alarming how much stuff there was like hey you can go to this vending machine if you scan your card then it just like debits off of your account and this and that and how much it was like wow Everything here is designed to just keep you here the entire time working. Everything. And they had like full on restaurants, like every coffee place you could think of. And but the idea was they just want to keep you like ensconced into this this place where you can't leave, nor would you want to. And that's that's a different thing. So go ahead, Forrest. No, so they've they've floated this idea. Sorry, I, I just thought of it because we were we like brought this part of it up. They've floated this idea in places like uh Wall Street Journal and stuff where they're like, you know what they could really do? They could have company towns. Company they've towns. literally floated right. the idea. Of, and but then you realize how sorry to bother of, you kind of does that a little bit, yeah. you know. <laughs> but but you realize how how stripped of uh, of of kind of context and histor- historical materialism that we kind of are as a culture and like our like our own history like things that happened here because they can kind of float the idea of company towns and make them seem kind of like almost like a cool like oh this is gonna be this different this is like a tech dormitory this is a different uh, a different you know thing than a company town but you know maybe the name company town could even come back and you realize how stripped of context people have been uh, you know because like stuff like uh, you know th- like. Mate One wasn't even one of the worst, uh, no. like company. Like it was actually one of the better ones. They had their own mm. mayor and they had a sheriff that was not, um, a, a, like a company man. Yeah, you I had the, uh, yeah, you had the <laughs> Ludlow <laughs> massacre seven years before this, I believe, right? Yeah, 1913, which was a similar situation and way bloodier even. Yeah, one of the things that actually this even plays down is, I mean, it hints at it, but it was much more explicit. Was the way they would manipulate currency uh their own script and their own prices so they often drop script pay up up uh exchange and then they would invalidate the currency periodically and how to get the currency valid was often yeah. literally having the miners wives <clears throat> sleep with um the foremans and stuff Jesus like Christ. that was part it- of this system and it was so it was like it would perpetually not just you know humiliate you but it would like um it would 
open up your family to all kinds of stuff. And that's why it got so bloody. Um, but they would, they would do that. People would have to go, wives would have to go sleep off the payoff script debt because they changed the prices. Um, and it was a totally internal economy. Right. Yeah. Well, the it's like economic thing... hitman stuff, but in its infancy, right? I mean, it's, it's, like the same it's thing similar we do to like other countries that we want to get leverage over. It, uh, it's and... like in the in the same way that um, sharecropping is like a kind of semi feudal holdover, like the fact that people are, end up in um, in debt peonage essentially and are tied yeah. to the land in like a semi serfdom. This is uh, a, a very similar system. It, you know, and, so and it's, it's like but the, the, re the reproduction of the workers is like is all internal to the production process. Sharecropping, I mean, sharecropping is kind of an interesting system, though, because it's been, uh, you know, because we fought the Civil War and, you know, we like we we understood kind of uh, as a society that, that you know, slavery was wrong. It could get um, kind of compared very easily to slavery. Like at the same at the same time, though, there were black workers in this system, in the script system that, that were um, literally saying this is slavery. Like we are in slavery. This is what yeah. slavery was when. <laughs> When you know what I mean, like before we had like broken away from the Confederacy, this is this is what slavery was, and this history gets gets buried because like ah well it's mostly backwards white people like you know and they're probably racist and you know just don't don't even listen to to, to this history of it. Another thing is that um with with the script system um a uh an an extremely um and, and I think that I think that John Sayles in this movie kind of does want to explicitly um c compare this to slavery right because slavery is evil that we've all kind of had from from the onset and we all understand that that's the evil and uh you know you know whatever whatever situation white miners were in it's like well look there were there were black miners in this there were uh immigrants that they literally had kidnapped which it doesn't talk about in the movie but literally a lot of them were just brought over yeah, that's my on, wife's family right there yeah so they so they were like literally kidnapped off the boat they would have someone waiting for them and then the person would just literally like grab them into a thing and put them into it like bring them to a mine and um and and they would get massacred by workers there because the workers are like well these are scabs which they are but like you know so there's all of these conflicts that are happening with you know a divide and conquer me methodology put forth by the coal companies and you know by the state sure. you know what i mean like the, keep, the keep point at each it, other's throats right like yeah. it'll, it'll make sure they're not at ours that's that's classic maneuver but a, but a big part of the demands throughout this entire thing was number one end the script system. We wanted to get paid in cash and then you know be able to spend it wherever. Which, yeah, you sh like obviously should be paid in, in cash. And the other thing was that even when they're giving out script, they're just kind of you know giving out whatever the the amount like the money is uh, in their own currency, which you can't spend anywhere else. So they get the money back. On top of that, um, they had their own weight checkers that you would bring in a ton of coal and they would say, oh sorry, that's not a ton because you're getting paid by the ton. That's not a ton, uh, you know, or or they would like um, make the, you know, they would have things that hold the coal that was bigger than a ton. They'd be like, oh, well, so they would they would constantly put their own thumbs on the scale, even when workers were getting like miners were getting paid uh, in company cash. Like <laughs> they're getting yeah. that money back and they're like, yeah, well, we don't even want you to to profit at all. Like a day's work, if you're not bringing in a ton of coal, you're not going to pay anything. So it's like literally um, one of the one of the big. Um, demands that they had in, in the beginning of, of, of all of these, uh, you know, of, of these battles, strikes, like just in general was uh, we want to have our own, which is an entirely reasonable demand, our own person weigh these, uh, weigh the coal. Right. Yeah. Like, like have like a, like a neutral arbiter, like basically not have it be dependent upon the, the moods and or ability or interest in downplaying what it is to devalue that uh that um that load right and, and and i think that that's that became more standardized as labor practices kind of became more organized that would be like hey you can't do that anymore like we know that you're like fucking with us here and we're not gonna let you do that anymore this this again goes back to the uh to the pre um uh, national Relation, national labor relation act of uh, of 1935 is that there's a reason why um unionism in this country still tends to to this day more so than, than say in europe or in asia uh tends to be more business unionism and tends to be relatively more conservative is because there didn't exist a strut there didn't exist the federal state capacity uh for there to be any regulation 
of this class contradiction. And so when workers stood up and say the Knights of Labor right after the, the Civil War or in the AFL, which arises in the in the 1880s and is like the first real longstanding conservative uh, craft uh, union in the in the United States, there was already a deep mistrust of state power on the part of the unions. And there was also, I guess what you could call almost like a like a libertarianism within the unions that said, like, let's let's keep the state out of this. And let's do this like direct and face to face bargain directly with the company and fight the company directly. And I think this is one of the big differences between the United States and say a place like Germany, where you know there was like uh, there was all there was a there was a strong state by what Varn like the eighteen nineties that was trying to, right. to forge a sort of class compromise. Right. Yeah. And so and a big a big oh Varn you, you can go. I just no, go I, ahead. I wanted to add a little addendum to to this, which is a big reason that um Blair Mountain failed is because. World War One had just happened, like literally just happened a few years before that. And a lot of the, you know, a lot of the miners had been soldiers or had family that were soldiers. And they were like, well, we, we're not we're not angry at the government. We're not angry at the state. We're, we're just angry at, you know, our bosses. So when when the military came in, like the U.S. military, a lot of these miners, most of them turned around and said, well, we don't want to fight the, the Conan. I pay you in script. Why are you why are you telling everybody that? <laughs> but, um, no, but every no, but like there's, wait, there's wait, Conan gets paid. Conan does not get paid. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but there's a big, there's a big, uh, there's a big, you know, on the part of um, like you know, the U.S. military. Finally, they come in. There's a there's a kind of a gap where they're like, oh, well, we're gonna have a battle. But then um, these uh, you know, these these Baldwin Phelps detectives come in and literally massacre more miners after most of them have gone home. Uh, right before Blair Mountain, and then they're like, "Well, you would literally just..." And it's not a, it's not an action that like would warrant. Um, it's literally just like vengeance. Like you've embarrassed us. We're gonna massacre as many. They they take some of them hostage, and they like massacre a bunch of other ones. And that's when the U.S. military gets called in, and the second military, you know, uh, people like linked with the state, kind of um, come into this camp. They're like, "All right, well, we don't want to fight the U.S. government. We're patriotic. We're we we just want our own." So they see the state as a separate entity. Mm -hmm. uh, the state government as a separate entity from the federal government and the federal government as someone that's not their enemy that is the, you know, a neutral arbiter. And like there's right. kind of a question if they were willing to go all the way and just go, you know what, we're going to like use the guerrilla war tactics on the actual like U.S. military, National Guard, like, you know, how far could this have gone? Protracted people's war, sorry, in Appalachia, the 1920s United States. Let's fucking go. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, there's in the United States has conditions that don't exist in Europe as far as the structure of our government. One, the federal government is is so far removed from most people's lives until the 20th century, it's barely an entity. We we you have to remember, like, we barely had unified money. Yeah. Like, like that's like all these things that we take for granted post World War One are modern things. Um, I mean, yeah. you know, the establishment of a national bank in the United States was like fought over for most of the of the 19th century. Um, the um, the fact that that federal rights apply to states is a artifact of the post civil war period and wasn't consistently enforced again until about the 1920s because usually the the supreme court which that's another rant about why leftists and liberals have trusted it ever mm -hmm. but um uh would normally weaken even amendments passed i mean uh the slaughterhouse cases for example weaken the um the federal supremacy cause and and birthright citizenship and all that stuff gets complicated by that um and so what you had was like who were you going to appeal to now interestingly if you want if you have similar labor disputes actually the similar labor disputes happen this way in china where uh, chinese workers will, will rebel against local companies and 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 even provincial governments but uh are, are fairly deferential to um the to the central PRC, a similar structure happens. Um, I would actually say that, like the the the, the labor militancy in Asia, um, is is interestingly not um, a, as big a part of 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 China's history because um, 
the union movement was so new there when the PRC was established and the all Chinese union has sort of subsumed it all. Um, and all form, uh, all strike actions that happen today are all definitionally wildcats. So, I mean, you see, you see this happen in other countries. It's not totally unique to the United States, but it's why we don't look like Europe. Um, and I mean, the, I think the other thing is like, we always talk about core and periphery with regards to us and other countries, but there's core and periphery within the U S and oh, yeah. Appalachia has always been the periphery still is. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's places in Appalachia that were getting electricity in the seventies. So like, yeah. you know, not to mention that's, that's that, that, that core periphery or like the urban rural divide, whatever you want to call it still to this day is used by capital, obviously, mm -hmm. right. The ability to move within a federal jurisdiction and have different, you know, tax structures and different proletarians, you know, who can be exploited to various different degrees is like one of the, the another huge thing that separates the United States from some place like Europe. But and and it's kind of I mean West Virginia feels like somewhere that's fallen fallen between the cracks in every possible sense and I mean on purpose right capital has been able to extract resources from there the same way like it's kind of America's third world within America like it, like it's but the fact that uh you know they they stuck with the Union in the Civil War also meant that like the Confederacy as you know Southern states gained power post uh you know post Civil War. And kind of got back to the status where you know they could literally hold up um, uh, negotiations or or any kind of legislation or any policy they wanted. Um, Conan, I just noticed you got one of your cats with you, and I yeah I, yeah yeah you wanted to get in on the discussion. I'll, I'll be back in one second. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but like so, there's this there's this uh, they're the periphery of the periphery, like the southern states that are willing to fight for southern you know a, a system that was relentlessly exploitative, a system that was relentlessly evil, but still they're willing to fight for their own interests and kind of make their state, um, you, know, you know, they're trying to extract as much capital for their state as they possibly can and for that system as they possibly can. West Virginia didn't even get that. Like West right. Virginia got kind of left behind by both like union states who were like, we're still well, both this is, yeah, like they're, they're like, well, you know, we're industrial up here. These are backwards rednecks. And they got left behind by southern states that were like, yeah, well, this is someone that's like, this is a state that's like a traitor. So, you know, when coal companies kind of come in, move in um, uh, just, just a little bit later and just start like grabbing up the land, nobody, there's no love lost uh, anywhere within, yeah. within, you know. <laughs> One thing I would say is interesting about West Virginia is tied to that. Like, so the South always has been used as a bulwark of cheap labor. It still is even like it really still is partly because of black and brown people, partly because it was never unionized, partly because of, of, of a thousand reasons, but there was a planter aristocracy that was kind of reincorporated into the bourgeoisie in the South. Yeah. And they really come to power in the 1920s and 30s. That's when all the stupid Confederate statues go up and all that. They're not from the 19th century yeah, they're, they're uh, there to make people the right people feel bad right and they're there to make the white people feel bad in the 20s and 30s like yeah. not yeah so that that's important it, um, it's important but, it's important to remember because they're they're there as to remind they're there right. to remind all the people that should be reminded of the things that they're meant to be reminded of and right. to say that they're like heritage or whatever is horseshit but anyway that's a separate topic. yeah that's not, but it's, it's, it's a total it's a but the, the reason why it's kind of important, though, is keeping the tensions between black and white workers was a way to suppress wages in the South. And you got to remember, like, up until the 1940s, you know, the only major industry in the South outside of agriculture was textiles. And if you know anything about uh, the way capital works, textiles are like the industrial capital you don't want because it's usually, you know, where the shittiest, cheapest uh sweatshoppy kind of conditions go it's and the other thing yeah. yeah and the other thing that's like that is extractive capital and both were all over the southeast but in west virginia there is no planter class to integrate mm. they didn't right. exist there so there's nobody to bring in uh to like be the responsible bourgeois to like make some kind of you know uh detente with a former aristocracy all you they literally just seen that entire state's literally just seen as shit hills and they kind of still are like has anybody uh, been there 
Yeah. I, 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 I never have. Tour. I'm a Yankee. Sorry. Yeah, no, yeah. Um, my, I'm my, on my tour and it's family. always as, as eye opening as ever. But it's like, oh, yeah, these guys. But my wife's family is, is Italian who emigrated to, to uh, Bluefield, West Virginia. Mm -hmm. and, and Bluefield gets mentioned a bit. Um, it's wild that, that that's where the papers for the, um, uh, for, for the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, private terrorist, um, uh, ended up being at, uh, cause, cause uh, I've been to Bluefield. Um, Bluefield is a very, very, very small town. You have to actually, if you're coming from the North, you have to drive 30 miles South of it and then drive up through a mountain to get there. It, it, it is, um, you can't Which is get pretty typical anymore. West Virginia stuff. You know, yeah, that's, yeah, that's but I, I mean, like, you, but just to paint a picture for 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 people, like like, and and Bluefield is like where um uh they were where that train everybody was waiting for at the end of the movie. That's where they're waiting for it to come from, which had like the the uh, um arrest warrants for the uh, uh for, for for the um thugs uh the you know the anti union thugs. Which yeah. by the, by the way, talking talking about that that kind of battle at the end of it um. I, I think it's, it's a fascinating, like, because it's kind of this really dramatic moment. I guess in real, in like, it lasted, like, all of two minutes in, in you know, literally, literally probably, I guess, real time. But, like, yeah, the that kind of battle is, like, something that, um you know, I I, I wanted to I wanted to bring it back to the movie itself, though, which I haven't been to West Virginia. I've been to Virginia a million times because of yeah, no, West Virginia is very different. Than Virginia. Could not possibly oh, yeah. totally <laughs> be different. Between that the two. Yeah. That doesn't, yeah, that doesn't surprise me. All of North and, Virginia is like military industrial contractors and spooks now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I haven't been to that part of well, I, I mean, probably I've stopped through it. But the part of Virginia I've been through is kind of the one like the more poverty ridden parts of Virginia. Like um, yeah. I I road trips from texas back to new york uh this summer and our we like our halfway point my ex-girlfriend and i we stopped and she needed like to sleep at, in the middle of this drive back and like so she ended up um falling asleep like at a gas station we parked there and i was trying to do work actually i was trying to do work for ben uh with my laptop <laughs> in the middle of a like this rural this rural gas station in virginia yeah and i kept uh i was i kept um trying to be like is there wi-fi somewhere like sounding like the most fucking yankee i possibly could and every single time every single time so they were like no there's no fucking wi-fi here like what the fuck are you talking about like, yeah and it's not it's it's not <laughs> just it's, wi -Fi. It's, not, it's not it's not just a yankee thing i mean that, that's like a, it's it's an outsider thing and and what's interesting yeah. is when i when you mention you know virginia and west virginia it is way more in common with the uh, southeastern Ohio, like you know, your Youngstown mm -hmm. with hills, pretty much. And I say that as someone I've played these places, and like these are places that like literally will brag about we were number one in crime for this year, you know, yeah. they're, because they're proud of being number one at something. Mm. Right? <laughs> you know what it's like? Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily brag about the fact you had the most homicides in the state of the year, but like that's the kind of thing. It, and that's well, the thing. Also, Eastern, I guess. Like if, Eastern, if, if you killed your whole police force, then maybe. Uh, yes, <laughs> that's not that's not what's Ohio happening. Anyway, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I almost I almost got a point out. Uh, Eastern Kentucky, <laughs> also number one I think is, is <laughs> Eastern Kentucky also is very much like that as well. Because when people think of Kentucky, they they rightly think of uh, of Louisville and that area. Eastern Kentucky shares a lot in common with West Virginia as well, which is one yes. of the reasons why. Um, Will Oldham is in this, or Will Youngham, which was my username earlier. <laughs> uh, at, at like sixteen, playing playing the the young preacher, uh, Dan, Danny Rand. Uh, that was get out of here. That's Will yeah. Oldham. That's, That's Will, Will Oldham. Oldham. Yeah. Oh shit! I Very was sixteen. Young Will oh, man. I love Will Oldham, man. Yeah. Yeah. Prince Billy. Yeah. Wait, Conan, you're number one at getting a point out. Don't worry about that. Uh, okay. so, <laughs> I thought religion was interesting in this movie too. Maybe we can talk about that. We, yeah, we well, I mean, it's, it, it is interesting. I mean, what what are the things that my, my ex wife is from Pennsylvania, so that's Western Pennsylvania, so that's that area around totally Johnstown same, same into into you know. So we used to go to Youngstown a lot, um, and uh, I when we would go from Georgia to Pennsylvania, we'd drive through West Virginia and we'd stay there. Um, and up, it's so it, it is. Yeah, I've been to Bluefield. Did you um, say, but you stayed in Bluefield. Yes, because okay, where else you, you going to stay in West Virginia? Uh, there's not many. Bluefield well, yeah, well, that's like, actually yeah. my wife's uh, family member's uh, hotel in Bluefield. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, the it's interesting because you can tell when you hit Appalachia, like 
Yeah. Like particularly the non-touristy parts, it's just Oh no, it's it's palpable. It's, Something changes in the air practically. You know, it's it, notable. And and that's also like in the southeast, you know, uh, where I'm where I'm from in Georgia, I'm from the Piedmont section of Georgia if, for those who don't know southern stuff that doesn't mean anything but uh we're just below you know just in that the foothills of the appalachian below atlanta um and a lot of my family is up in the appalachians and that's when you see the religious stuff really filled in a lot of the gaps but the religion there is really 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 different that is where snake handling churches are from that is where like holiness movements took on um and a lot of that seemed to fill in social uh, social functions that were just totally not built up by the state, even the local capacities. Yeah. Uh, basically, the churches filled in the gap, and that was true here too. And and the churches played a big role in anti unionization. I was I was gonna say like yeah. the the modern sort of like ideological red scare that it comes out of uh, evangelicals in Seattle after the Seattle general strike of eighteen eighteen were some of the first ones to start passing around tracks that were like specifically anti-union, anti-Bolshevik, you know, as they would say at the time, because they had seen this threat, you know, that arises when workers took over the entire city. You know, they called it Bolshevism, but evangelical evangelism, evangelism, um, you know, it doesn't always take this sort of uh, reactionary role, but well, what uh, I found interesting often does. Too- uh, what I found interesting too was was the use of the song, uh, the, you know, "There's Power in the Blood," the old, the old gospel that they sing multiple times in the movie, yeah. which became "There's Power in the Union." Uh, now, now my, on my dad's side of the family, um, uh, they were uh, Salvation Army people. Preach and, it, Crow preacher. <laughs> and, and the Salvation Army was known for going to union meetings and doing what they called a people's filibuster to shut down the union meetings mm. by playing. Um, songs like there's power in the blood and mm. uh what the unions are do with like uh people like joe hill we get up there and start leading the union and singing there's power there's power there's power in the union um so you know i never do that that's good uh yeah, yeah no it's 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 wild um i i think i think one one fact that i found out during uh this movie um that kind of uh shows the, the crack that really like st- these, these like west virginia um towns had fallen through in appalachia in general but like you know this whole area had kind of fallen through but like because they are somewhere you can just kind of extract things from and it's kind of in this we're, we're extracting things uh you know we love to extract we're big we're big extraction people here in in the u.s we Empire, love to extract it. folks we love it we love, we love it. it more yeah, and more we're, people we're, are talking know, about it big extract <laughs> Oh, 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 it broke forest. <laughs> Actually, no. oh. you've, you've never seen it. Our, our, our big, our, our big, uh, you know, um, are realizing that kind of West Virginia, this place that more than anywhere else, it kind of falling through the cracks. Um, towns start popping up, right? Like company towns and Matawan, like, or like Matawan is not the, like anywhere close to the, like Mat- Matawan is not. I, I keep pronouncing it wrong. It's it's, it's May one, but I May thought one. it was Madam one. one for like. I yeah. always no, I did too. Matt but, one. I only knew from the movie that it was May one. That's so so May one. So May one's one of the least uh one one of the better ones because at least they have their own mayor and they have their own sheriff. Most of the, you know most are just kind of company people that they've put because there's a lot of coal companies. And they all come in, they buy up the land, and the coal companies realize they do have class solidarity because they all decide yeah. together. That they're going to hire these Baldwin felt detectives, but but so yeah, um, so it's Josh Mostel is the mayor in this one, and then it's uh, David uh, Strathorn. Um, yeah, as the, who's, who's as always pre Nomad Land where he's you know crushing unions, uh, but you know whatever. Um, Don't stop. <laughs> oh, come on, uh, come Expanse. On. He was, he was no, so but, great in the Expanse. So no, so 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 um, the name, like the name itself, right? Like like um, like Mate One, like the na- that name comes from um, Beacon, New York, which is. 15 minutes for me like it's the next exit on the throughway and the reason that it's named the original name is Mateoan, which is a you know an indigenous word um like that's the name of the, the original uh town or city the, you know what 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 before when it was first incorporated and the reason that they named it that is because all the stuff to build the town had come on the train from new york and they're like oh where did the train come from let's just name the town after that so that kind of shows you how fast and how little thought really went into creating a lot of these and territories. They added really. all those syllables to it. <laughs> Light one. <wild. laughs> well, that's because when you go to West Virginia, you lose a couple syllables. No, 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 no. You gain them. You gain them. <laughs> you know, when you go up to the whale, 
<laughs> well, and I like the there was, I think yeah. that uh, Sales, who really excels at portraying these types of characters in these kinds of places, more in in a true and real feeling way than a lot of directors. You know, you have like Brighty May, that character, right? Mm -hmm. Who just, just like sits at the at the train station, like like watching like people come in and stuff. And like if you've ever <laughs> If you've ever been out in America, like in proper America, that is absolutely a thing that that happens. Like you know, you you see the you know I was uh, personal experience. You know, drive through like a rural area and you see like shirtless kids with like you know no shoes on, just like staring at you the entire time because they've never seen like a van come through, mm -hmm. and they're like, "What is this?" Like it, it sets the tone so well that this is very far from a lot of places where there could be potential help and that's mm. what makes it so interesting that you have mm. the very excellent chris cooper which by the way chris cooper's great in this role as, wait we're uh, talking about a movie i, yeah. I don't uh, think i've ever seen him play uh, <laughs> i'll play a good guy before because yeah I, chris I, cooper's usually like like either a heavy or a politician or like a, yeah. a general or like you know some shit like that uh and well according you know, to the uh you know he's he's the evil heavy in this movie if you own a coal company Right. <laughs> oh my god a union man he's well, a sheriff is, and a union man a bolshevik Holy yeah. fuck. you know but you it know does a good oh i was gonna say it does a great job of showing him as, as like the actual danger of being a guy that goes from town to town doing this and, and like fighting you know these you know 60 different battles in 60 different places uh, for, for basically terraforming a planet as far as like, you know, planting ideas and, and things along those lines. Go ahead, Varn. And well, the, when in Sorry to Bother You, kind of uh, Glenn, Glenn from Walking Dead, like he, oh, yeah, he kind yeah, yeah. of, yeah, he plays a very similar role. The, the, the modernish kind of version yeah. of that, right? Yeah. yeah. And also kind of the scummier version of that because he's just kind of fucked well. everything that <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah, Chris Cooper's clearly there to. He's not so much salting. He's not trying to build a union. Union's already built, mm -hmm. but he's trying to get the unions in correspondence with other unions. And he's try, he's to get, trying to, if the seeds are planted, he's trying to get them to sprout. Right, right. right. To, to coordinate. I mean, and that actually becomes a problem in the movie that's kind of addressed, but not addressed. Um, it doesn't go into it very deeply as like how how the IWW's internal politics and the way it was focusing on the Northeast and the West led it to like not really focus on the south and so when they asked for like strike authorization with the larger iww they couldn't get it in quickly and eventually had to work on their own the other thing i like about this movie um i have some i i think chris Coos is awesome in this movie his performance is great um i think the character has one flaw and that is i don't believe that character would have also been the pacifist i do believe there might have mm. been one but right. it wouldn't have been that guy it wouldn't um have been him. Yeah. He was so <laughs> passive too like, like um i remember watching a long, a long way a long yeah. way to uh, uh like everyone talk all at once yeah no, <laughs> so it takes us well a lot of the stuff i say is very pointed trying to get a conversation in a certain direction there's a there's a clip that i have of john sales talking about where he got the uh well, sorry, all I bring to this... If, if he brings no. up Boxcar Bertha, I'm going to cut you. I, uh, no, you have the I, ability I, to kick everyone off the show for us. You don't need to justify <laughs> yourself. It's fine. I introduced everything. I let things go, and I bring in clips. What else? I just sit here besides that. But um, no, so I, I have a clip of, of uh, John Sale talking about who is kind of a real character and who isn't. And obviously, the Chris Cooper character is not real. It's kind of just explaining so, to an audience like the purpose of a union and yeah. where this kind of union organizing comes from. Mm -hmm. But it also, I mean, I think his role really does show uh, kind of how far West Virginia miners were falling through the cracks. Like, because the thing is that the, I think uh, UVM or like the, the, the United mine, like the miners union or whatever, right. That had decided in, in a lot of cases, they were extremely corrupt. They didn't want to actually challenge capital in any, in any way, shape or form. And they kind of uh, backed away from this, right? Like, they, they were kind of, they were like, well, West Virginia is not somewhere we want to represent in the first place. Um, they, they kind of got failed by them. They got failed by, um, you know, like, like uh, just in, in every really way, right? Like the, the uh, IWW fail, kind of failed them because they're not getting really money down the line that they're supposed to get. And they're based somewhere else. They're based elsewhere. And kind of this like uh, IWW workers coming in to kind of organize them. And it's like, well, they're in Pittsburgh and like the money and stuff will get there when it gets there. Mm -hmm. And they're allotting a certain amount. So that part of it has failed them. 
and uh you know they I mean, even used a yeah. uh, an, an eldritch slur in that that you don't hear anymore which is uh they called them hunkies bunch of hunkies yeah. up in pittsburgh and then and then at the same time you have this uh you have the, the like, someone that's literally working and they didn't um i don't think they express it very well the guy that uh that betrays them in the end um is literally not just working like not just suddenly working for baldwin Feltz. he is someone that has gotten like he he got famous for being this baldwin Feltz spy mm -hmm. and running the safe house and being someone who like uh even even like he he lasted for decades like he only died in like the 70s or the 60s or something like this movie is in the 20s like he he bragged about and and also testified against um uh like sid hatfield and also was the one that was stepped out in the shadows and murdered sid hat like there's just so much um that this movie because i think it is it's structured as a western can't really cover but like these are some of the, some of the figures within this movie are real people and some of them are yeah i mean it, it's already a pretty long movie if you try to include all the all that stuff it's like it's gonna be a six hour is it series. is well, it like too late for uh, why why is few clothes is it is it uh too late for a metawan 2 or like a gritty <laughs> reboot the of metawan like joker or something like that i'm here for it man that prestige cool. television Mato series yeah. cole boogaloo you know what i mean like, <laughs> but so I, so yeah. real real quick sidebar this is chris cooper's first feature film by the way I don't know if everybody knows that. Like he everybody well, he said it in the beginning. We watched the John Sales clip and he said it. Not only was he not bankable, nobody knew who he was. It was it was his first feature <laughs> film. Like yeah. so he is he basically was his friends with John Sales who who was like yeah. this guy would be great in this role. And I think that that um and again, I just can't oh, talk enough about how John Sales has like a good feel for this kind of thing in all of his films that like he just he's he's really good at that kind of thing. Cuz like look at now like how many times have we seen Chris Cooper in like in in movies oh yeah he's a that guy it's that dude i like that yeah, guy yeah, that guy's yeah. good you know <laughs> and That's... it all started here and uh i guess one other one other thing i want to say before i before playing this clip is that um i mean as we see someone like uh joe manchin right that kind of holds up um and, and i mean i think you can argue that he's holding up legislation for the interests of the democratic party in america's general. senator yes joe manchin but, uh, <laughs> the only one that really decides anything no but um the the fact that these coal companies right that are evil in this movie and are evil just in general are kind of the the backbone of what holds america up for a long time like you know what i mean like because they've decided like america the industrial revolution runs on coal like our industrialization runs on coal but we've left that industrialization so when you see someone like joe manchin who's heavily invested with the coal companies the villains in this movie the reason that he acts the way that he does and wants to retain power as much as he does. And it is the fact that like his industry is slipping away. Like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? As we, as we enter uh, parts of the you know yeah. economy and, and things haven't changed for workers necessarily, like in a lot of ways, but things have changed for the actual uh, industry control of who actually matters. So you're, you're watching even people like Joe Manchin slip through the same cracks. Personally and financially invested both. Yeah. No, a hundred. So it's like, it's interesting to like be talking about this movie now, I think. And to have Bernie the reason kind of, why we can't have meaningful climate change legislation is because of that. Fantastic. And, uh, and, and to have Party. Bernie literally, Bernie literally, <laughs> you know, put the words out there to which side are you on, on a cable show recently, which I don't, I mean, that's such a low bar. Like it's such a low mm -hmm. bar, but it is something that's like, well, this is something that, you know, hasn't gotten referenced in the same way. Oh, Bernie Sanders, you know, whatever you want to say about him is very much part of that tradition. Like the guy did a fucking, didn't he record like a, um, like an album of like spoken word shit about uh, Eugene yes. Debs? He's like yes. maybe well, the no, only no, no, popular figure he, in American he, history that uh, he made a I'll documentary. He made a documentary about Eugene Debs. Okay. He recorded a spoken word album of uh, workers like union songs. Um, I know that because I'm someone that creates my own documentaries. So it was like, oh shit, this guy makes a, uh, low-key documentaries that they got paid like a tiny bit of money to make from historical archives that's fucking awesome <laughs> no and, and, and that album that he recorded is awesome too it's 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 just great because he just says like so this awesome. land is your land this land is my <laughs> land from, he, that's literally like that's the most yes. famous uh from but they, they have like the story choir in the background right. and like like 
all the 80s excess of, of uh, <laughs> uh, overproduced music going on, and then just Bernie Sanders cutting in, going, This yeah. land is your land. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's quite surreal. Almost as surreal as his public access show where he talks to mall goths and lectures children. Yes. They tried to smear it with that, and I was like, No, that makes him fucking. Like, cool. It makes him look fucking awesome. Are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> <laughs> he's like Wayne and Garth. Yeah, exactly. Excellent. Potty on. Potty on. <laughs> I'm having some computer troubles right now. If I lose you guys, I'm sorry. And and how did you approach like the, the characterization? Because I mean, one special thing about your movies, I think, is that you often have a view of a community and many voices and many points of view in a community. Mm -hmm. And and that's probably something that you went in going, but the challenge there is like which side are you on <laughs> is, is the mm -hmm. kind of thing how do you make sure that it's balanced or do you want it to be balanced how did you work that out you know there there's um four or five actual historical characters who there was a little bit written about them sid hatfield who was the sheriff um the agent provocateur um for the management people c.e lively was a real person the character that james earl jones played a uh, few clothes johnson was based on a real person uh, the rest of them are kind of composites, and um, I had read there wasn't really that much kind of history written about these people, but I found a lot of diaries, um, things that were written by, oh, my dad and I used to go down in the coal mines in the 20s, and this is what it was like, or, mm -hmm. you know, even one woman whose mother had run a boarding house in a, in a, a company camp. Mm -hmm. um, in some some stuff written by immigrants, and and that was the first job that anybody in their family got. So, using those, I kind of put the characters together, mm -hmm. um, thinking about them. I read um, uh, books by a couple of the um, not so well known, but you know, guys who were pretty high up in the Wobblies, mm -hmm. um, because I figured that the character Chris Cooper. Um, you know, plays is somebody who has been an IWW organizer, a wobbly, and then now has kind of, you know, been sent out by this fairly new UMW um, to see what he can do. Yeah. I think one of the things that I, I feel I felt most impressed by in Mate, Mate One is the language of the film, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that so much of the way that people speak in it is uh, for lack of a better word, so union-y. Um, <laughs> even in in union films, in like strike films, it's not necessarily the norm, I would say, to use the language that has been traditionally associated with union mm -hmm. organizing, the sort of brother and sisterness that kind of comes out mm -hmm. of a different kind of colloquialism. Um, and I think that's one of the more interesting aspects to me of the movie. And I was wondering if there was, if that was um, something that, you worked on for the film you know it's something that i ran into doing my research um you know like the masons have their secret handshakes and words and stuff like that um because being a union man was often very dangerous there was a kind of sub rosa language and then there was the official language that they would use with each other so it was a little bit like being in a certain kind of cult or religion or whatever i got a lot of it from old umw journals and some of it from the wobblies and the wobbly publications um it was as uh, kind of fervent a belief as this is just going to solve everything. This is a time in America in, in, the, in 1920 when an awful lot of people are working in industry, whether they're immigrants or they've been here for a couple generations. So it, it, it seems like we have the masses. Mm -hmm. We are massed. We're not isolated on farms anymore. Like the Wobblies were trying to you know, really organize fairly isolated people. Um, these are people who are all together and they're kind of under one roof. We should be able to do this. And this is really going to work. Mm -hmm. And so there was, there was a kind of excitement about that. And it was kind of like, you know, if you were, you, you, you might not wear it as a badge, but you know, it was kind of like being in a club. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Badges. We don't need those sticking badges. Mm. I, I don't know if the real question that someone would ask uh, to try, try to find out whether somebody's a Baldwin Feltz agent or working in a union is like which eye is like Big Bill Haywood missing mm. because I feel like you could just kind of be working for uh, Baldwin Feltz. You'd be like, well, you should probably know what I like. You've seen pictures of the guy, like you know what I mean. Like 
maybe Probably took maybe, out the eye. <laughs> I don't know. So I, that that seemed like that was the one question I think. Well, they also asked about like a Jack London book, which is you know whatever. But like it, it's like some of the questions were a little bit basic. It's like uh, someone has just been doing like a little bit of union research and is like, oh, there goes oh. there goes Sean. Yeah, he said yeah. his internet connection. They, they, they read the Wikipedia page, is what you're saying, and then, then uh, wrote, <laughs> wrote the script. <laughs> what well, is a union? And then yeah. they're like, "Well, a union is." And they're like, <laughs> "You figured out the code." There, there's a, there's a. So uh, listening to Revolutionary Left Radio, one of the things is that um, both both the the army that was uh, working, both the army that was working with uh, the coal companies. And uh, I like that you took the the initiative to change the name on the. <laughs> that, that's Andy World and I's shtick, by the way. We do that quite a bit. That's good. I like it. Um, no, but I, I really I like that both. Well, all right. So the story that both the U, the union, uh, like the the army's working for like you know unionizing like the workers, the miners, and um, and the, like the the army working. By the time that Blair Mountain happened for capital, like for the coal mining companies, um, they both had passwords. But I guess at, at one point, one of the battles leading like right up to Blair Mountain was that um, the password used by uh, the, the the coal mining company's army, which was entirely made up of volunteers that like were pretty much told like, oh, you guys haven't unionized yet. And, uh, you know, you're going to lose your jobs if you if you don't if you don't join this army, like we own this army, this is the army go in there and kill other coal miners. Mm. So that army, their password was like, amen. And when they asked like password, cause I guess both armies didn't know whether they were, which side they were working for. They didn't know which side are they on. And uh, I guess the password was amen. And when they didn't know it and they used different passwords, they just started shooting at each other. And that Oof. was like one of the battles right before Blair mountain. <laughs> Classic blunder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, I did also just kind of wanted to uh, touch on the music if Conan wanted to talk about that I would, I would uh, love to uh, I, I, I do absolutely um, uh, even though I thought it was a little too sharp but that's just me <laughs> that's just that, that kind of singing um, oh yeah you mean like musically sharp yeah 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 No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well you know there's a, there's a rich yeah. tradition for West Virginia of you know that that manner of uh feeling it not necessarily like being note perfect necessarily right but yeah. uh I, I and and it being something where like look at the alternative right like you, they they that music was developed because yeah i personally love alternative coal mining music you know <laughs> i don't like that mainstream coal mining music it sucks you, you like the stuff that they brought in the uh the mandolins from the uh from the uh, italians yeah that was i thought that was that was like a little corny but i think it was cool how they showed how like the black guy had the harmonica the italian had the mandolin yeah. and there's the fiddle and then and they're basically yeah. like creating like american culture at that point right? yeah Amer yeah, yeah, american yeah, culture to, like, is being created i remember going to a folk festival uh actually no it was a bluegrass festival um years ago and uh they, they had like this um workshop where this guy was uh talking about the history of the mandolin and how like that 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 picking was uh developed because you couldn't uh hold out a note on the mandolin so so they they yeah. multiple pick uh, uh there's a name for that I know Conan probably knows it off the top of his head. Um, um, uh, wait, I, I just I, I want to say it's also really interesting that um, you go from kind of you know like music that's kind of just being developed, to kind of keep this struggle going on, right? Like the labor struggle and kind of music that is kind of being developed in these camps. Like there's not a lot going on between these battles, and it's interesting. That well, in the yeah, 60s, that's th this. This is the point I was going to make. That a lot of it's just born of like there's a lot of time spending sitting around. Yeah, like well, you're for, sitting for, around, right? And you got to. But the updated, yourself. the updated version is that in the '60s, people like Pete Seeger or uh, you know Phil Ox or you know, there's a lot of different Bob Dylan even could kind of just go around and collect these songs and then like profit off of just being like, this is a an oh, album. Yeah. And Woody Guthrie did it too. Woody Guthrie kind of. Um, I was I was thinking like I was thinking about it the other day, and I saw this thing that was like, oh, Woody Guthrie kind of created uh, with his Dust Bowl ballads, like kind of created like the first concept album is what like some i mean which i don't think probably is true but like you know some some outlet put it out that was like oh well this is kind of the first concept album which is it's funny that you could kind of in the early uh 
you know, well, in, in like the 60s, 50s, like that whole time period, you kind of just go around from town to town and like ask like, hey, did you guys ever come up with any songs? Yeah, yeah. Well, like, if they weren't published, then it was fair game, right? Yeah. So like, yeah. Okay. Like, well, like, I mean, I'm gonna make an album. Like, what? How do you publish songs? a song? Like, like a newspaper? Like, what are you talking about? And I mean, Alan Lomax, Don't worry about you know, it. Went through it and made a. I mean, you know, collected a bunch over the years too. So, so, so you have that that long history of people going through and finding it, and and also like um, uh, when Woody Guthrie wrote songs, he would actually just adapt the tunes of uh, whatever yeah. people were using. So, so like he he'd actually would write. Uh, his, he wouldn't write the music to his songs. Um, and a lot of times he'd just be doing, building it on tr more traditional songs, which Bob Dylan also did a bit of. Um, uh, well, it was that whole folk music movement. Like it's just, yeah. it's, it's interesting that kind of became a, uh, like a, a musical style, right? Like it became its own job. Well, I mean, that's like, what folk music was in the sixties as opposed yeah. to today. Cause, cause I mean, today it's just, Oh, we're just going to play, you know, Woody Guthrie songs or, or we're just going to play, um, uh, you know, you know what, whatever songs, um, uh, and and we're but we're going to play you know all these these old timey instruments and and but, but uh, it's not like it was you know where they're actually finding and learning these songs and, and bringing them to a new audience. But Conan, I want I want to hear what you had to say about. It. Sorry, I just wanted to bring up that point because I've been listening to a lot of folk music late, like like Woody like Woody Guthrie and PC like that whole like that whole style of music, and I just thought it was funny that it, like you kind of just go to a town and be like. Let me hear your songs and be like, if the songs are good, you'd be like, I'm going to make an album out of those songs. <laughs> well, I, and, and, and the, but the idea of being able to profit off of it, like, was like, like that was absolutely not even like in the picture. In any way, well, it, was in, I think, it was impossible until you had like mass production of records. Well, you, first uh, of all, you had to have, let's have be clear. music be a commodity. Yeah. yeah. First of all, you had to be able to do a record music. So we'll start right. with that. And then you would have to have like a device for people to listen to music, so on and so on. And that was all pretty new. And nobody knew it was going to last. You still had people work. Well, the real money is in the sheet music. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Ten pan and, alley. <laughs> exactly. And that's that's where culture was at the time. But the idea that, um, you know, most of these tunes, like the, the point that we were making earlier is that like we're just born out of like sitting around. They're sitting around waiting for something to happen. Like, all right, well, I got this here. Oh, I got this over here. Great. Let's, you know, let's make a story. And so a lot of these, but a lot of these uh, tunes were almost like folk tales to a certain degree, right? Like, you know, like the songs themselves, like the, the, the things that were mentioned, um, you know, would either be his, a, historical, a, a historical tall tales. It would maybe vary, like the, the protagonist would like vary from like town to town or county to county or whatever. And that was pretty common until the idea of, you know, there being recorded music changed it to being like, no, this is the definitive version here. It's like, well, there's also five other definitive versions depending on who you ask in, in other states. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, if, a, if, if, if it's famous that a song is like good or, or a story is good, right? And you're in a town controlled by a coal mining company, let's say, like you're yeah. not going to have the same um, heroes in your music as uh, you know, as you would in a union town. Mm. Well, even, the even recorded music, there's not a definitive version but until very recently. Cause look at how many versions look of at the Stagger right. Lee or Stago Lee. Mm -hmm. um, like that, the that folkways thing and all like the, uh, the people that chronicle that kind of, stuff. and that's, you know, that's real fascinating stuff. Um, it's not as fascinating as this film that we're ostensibly here to discuss or yeah, but, but you can went. see elements like, of it in there. So it's kind of nice to kind of just pick it apart just a little bit. It's very organic, you know, it's very organic yeah. and it, it, it comes out in the way that, um, again, was, was born out of how these songs were born out of just like people sitting around and like they had trying to entertain themselves while like, you know, maybe waiting for something heavy or just waiting in general. Uh, you know, a great scene in the movie is where, you know, they're, they're kicking in. Then those guys with the guns come in, you're like, uh Oh, and they're like, Oh, they're just, they're hunting small game. And he's like, he's like, Oh, you know, help yourself to all the rabbits, but please don't mess with my pigs. Like those. those yeah. Rumors. Like I, I paid for these pigs. The rabbits are <laughs> kind of, yeah. Rabbits, rabbits are, are kind of here. Like <laughs> that's on you, you know, go take care of that. But like that, and that's his way of tacit tacitly supporting their initiative mm -hmm. without like necessarily being like involved by like making life easier for them, knowing that like part of what's happening is they're trying to be starved out. So yeah. like by providing them ostensibly with a food source, like, you know, it's like a bare, bare minimum. Right. But like that's sort of, you know, the way of like maintaining uh, enough neutrality so as not to be like targeted by the company, but like engaging in a way that's like a, the soft support of um, 
uh, you know, from, from a great tradition of, you know, maybe you don't have to be the loudest voice in the room to be supportive of a cause. Well, you, you get, you get a lot of information from that one scene and I wish you kind of got more information about it because it, it, number one, there's the divide and conquer side of it. Right. Which is, those are the hill people. Like those are like, those are like the real hillbillies. Like we're working for a coal mining company. We're kind of above that. Those are the people who kind of, um, didn't like the same way that I said, kind of, it's almost like an indigenous uh, owning of the land, right? Like you might not have a, an, a physical deed for the land, but there's a bunch of land and the coal company comes in and just kind of takes that land from you. Um, like, so those are the people that kind of the coal company relentlessly profited off of because it's like, this is a, this is a family that's kind of understood by everybody uh, has possession of this large tract of land because they're hunting on it. And it's like the coal companies come in realizing that there is a, an extractive profit to make off of this area. Like kind of just takes the land and is like, yoink. Huge no tracts actual... of land. <laughs> yes, huge <laughs> tracts of land. Anyway, but um, no, but they kind of understand like this, like um, by creating kind of this feudal order because they're not uh, industrialized yet. Um, it's like they, they, they're, they've understood that like there's probably not a real deed to this area this is an area that's kind of going by their own rules and by using state power to just be like yeah this is our land we'll give you a tiny bit of money for it which you know how the the, the northeast i guess and the entire country but like also the government did that with uh you know they, they would just kind of take your land from you and be like we'll give you a little bit of money if you want to go to court for it but uh you know we have we have power to do that <laughs> as both like a corporate power and a state power. So like you can kind of just get your land yoinked from you throughout this entire time period, like including especially into the FDR years, which, you know, but, you know, like talk, talking through this, like I wish they had kind of mentioned the Hill people more because it does seem like even in this, uh, even trying to explain how this union order, this like came about, like it still seems like there's still these, uh, these levels to it, right? Like, they do. They make. They make sure to show you that you know the scabs that they brought in, black workers, immigrant workers, like that literally had been kidnapped from where they were. Like mm. they, they don't touch that in the movie, but like they had been. Like a lot of people had gotten like off the boat at Ellis Island, and there's someone waiting for them. They just pulled them into a fucking car and brought them down to a, a mine in West Virginia. Like, um, like I like, got a spicy meatball for you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you want yeah. the you want the spaghetti? I got the spaghetti. And they get in the car and it's like you're going to a goddamn mine. <laughs> <laughs> the food stuff was really funny when they were um there was like the hill woman, the older hill woman with the kids, and then there was the Italian woman with the kids, and they both had cornmeal. And yeah. the Italian woman's trying to make polenta out of it. And the hill woman's <laughs> like, she's destroying it. She's turning it into slop. How could you eat that? And it's like literally the same thing, people. Come on. Yeah. yeah. But eventually she ends up giving her a, um, a rabbit. So that's it's a nice ending. Yeah. yeah I don't like that as someone who has had pet rabbits that I liked a lot. And you know what? Pets are made cold. Canceled for environmentalism. It, it was a rabbit <laughs> actor. The a actor was uh, the rabbit was acting. No harm was done to any rabbit. Yeah, really. Gets back up. What's up, Doc? <laughs> I, I, I heard he got the Academy Award that year for uh, best animal. <laughs> hey, there he is. Best rabbit in a non Looney Tunes. Uh, <laughs> um, I feel like Varn should have came back in with like a Looney Tunes burn, kind of like effect. <laughs> That's all, folks. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, you gotta say, movie night, bar night, movie night, bar night, movie night, bar night, fire. <laughs> <laughs> Can we? Um, so we got into a discussion a while ago about uh, the Will Oldham character, the Danny Radner, the the like the young preacher who's clearly like sides with the the union guys, and like I found one scene in this film to be very intense, which is the way where he's basically like he's trying to get across that there's danger. And like tells the story of Joseph to do so. Yeah, mm. good scene. And I was like, wow, this is awesome because it's like he's he like the way he's telling that story. And I'm let's be explicitly clear. And, and I'm not a big I'm not a big Bible guy, but <laughs> I thought that the way that he did Bible that was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> but the, but the way that he does it in a way that's like just surreptitious enough that those those uh the detectives are in the back like you know hooting it up trying to intimidate people and they're not that really was really it. smart yeah and, and right after they were so mocking cool. him for not knowing the bible 
So, yes. Yeah. You right. Know, th that's what made that scene even better. Was just that you know, just like oh, you, you're awfully young to be a preacher. You know, we think about yeah. the Bible. What are you, you a squirrel smell? preacher? You're preaching to the squirrels. It, and we're rabbit, like the we're the rabbit preachers nuts. over here. We, you know. <laughs> I mean, he was able to deliver a complicated story and out an informant by a biblical allegory. That's yeah. pretty impressive. Which pretty is impressive. pretty stunning. Like that's that's honestly without that's... mentioning Judas, I might add. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. No, that, that was great writing right there. I I, th I thought that that you know, there's a lot of like really cool moments in this, but I thought because like the like the stakes of what's happening, which is like ultimately this, this is a small room, right? But it's like there's people in and out of the room in mortal danger if he says the wrong thing. Well, yeah, I mean, and as, I was like, you know, God, that's so great that he, he pulls that off. The, the other the other thing that I think is very '80s in this movie is that in the beginning they kind of lead up to the stakes of these two different you know mindsets when it comes to preachers by having the uh, they have the um, you know the good the good uh, the money evangelical right like the 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 you know the the gospel like preached most often now that during the reagan era it's kind of like um money is almost like a uh we'll call it the uh, righteous gemstones cult. philosophy <laughs> but he says um his name is beelzebub lord of flies right now earth today his name is bolshevik communist union man lord of untruth sower of evil seed enemy of all that is good and pure and this creature walks among us and it's the same way that kind of it's not that religion by its very um by its very nature is evil but religion in in these communities right where it's kind of someone comes to town and just starts just starts a preaching um like it can well, and, be used as whether like it can be used as a positive force or a negative force because this is and how, you see both sides yeah. that's what's so cool because yeah. danny radner's character like um, just immediately undercuts it and gives like you know like a total like pro uh humanitarian like working class and like the grandma's like i thought it was good you know like, well, like, I also, it was like also that preacher stands up like you know what yeah. i mean he's gonna intimidate him and then he's like i gotta get yeah. the fuck out of here like, i gotta i gotta <laughs> urge an appointment to be anywhere but here i and, think that jesus would have been in the union and the guy's like and he's like all right well that's my time that's I, all uh, folks <laughs> <laughs> right so, what are we gonna say barn no, it's interesting because actually, if you look at the history of the Southern Baptist Convention, its history is almost that, except the conservative side won. Um, right. The early progressive movement was highly tied up in the early evangelical movement. I mean, there's William. There's a reason why William Jennings Bryan is important to both. Um, uh, I mean, he was a fundamentalist, and he was, you know, he was a, a, a proto labor Smoke person. Child, baby died in the middle of it. <laughs> right, um, but it's it's. Uh, what happens with with the Baptists is they go from siding with the with with workers and and actually with with more liberal forms of Christianity becoming arch conservatives within like two decades. Mm. So it's in that time period of the twenties and the forties where that happens, and that happens over and over again. That's not just a phenomenon of the United States. In South Korea, for example, in the Koreas, for example, um, the, the country was about divided between uh christian buddhist and animist and the christians actually tended to side with the communist until the establishment of the dprk and then they become the uber reactionaries like they flip sides mm. um so that happens kind of over and over again in history well Debs was a committed i mean committed christian like that was a big part of why he felt like uh at least you know the mythos of it right like why he felt like every every uh, worker and every every laborer really deserve the same thing, and I, I mean he does drop the ball within this, you know, West Virginia because they think nationally, I think, and the the idea is he's kind of like the Bernie of his time, where he's like, well, you could you could vote your way out of this, and it's like, no, you can't vote your way out of this, but mm. you know what, good job, bud. Like, I'm I'm glad that you chimed in, um, <laughs> but like the. <laughs> The, the whole wow. idea of... Uh, <laughs> That's some read, but okay, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so I, was told, I was listening to Revolutionary Left Radio, and they kind of went into the idea of the... Um, they called him a pussy, like, actually. Like, it was crazy. No, but like the, the idea of it was that, you know, they kind of got bailed on by every possible... Uh, this was like this specific movement action, right? Like the, the, the Eugene Debs is thinking kind of nationally and thinking, well, we can kind of agitate our way into things by kind of going on the national ballot and our vote like totals keep increasing and we've kind of stood up at this point to um like like we've kind of stood up against world war one and like our vote totals and every election keep increasing 
Maybe so we he's can like vote. Disco Stu on that episode of The Simpsons where he's just like, if disco keeps getting more popular and popular, yeah, <laughs> 1976 to 1980. So yeah, so so that's like you know the first level of it, but then also the IWW, which is the the you know breaks away like Eugene Debs, who founded the IWW, has broken away from Big Bill Haywood, who's the leader of, of that movement, because he's like, well, this movement is too far. Like you're literally destroying the old machine, like, the machines that working like that workers work on right like we don't want to do that kind of agitation we want to do a more political version of it so that's like a, a second level of failure because in this case Bill, big bill haywood kind of bails on by the time blair mountain comes around right like bails on it which that split is like the most famous intra-left uh conflict in in american history because even uh helen keller even helen keller could see that, that was too far <laughs> and wrote a piece in mainstream papers i think uh, it was it was within uh i think spca's main thing where she's like you guys need to get along you guys are really messing up the thing but but the you know workers in west virginia had fallen through the cracks of all of those institutions they'd kind of taken it into their own hands and that this you know this movie doesn't necessarily express that very well because um you know chris cooper kind of brings them back to him and is like well when you guys break away from us and listen to like a snitch Maybe things aren't going to go too well for you, but it still is. The, this, it's a systemic failure from the institutions that are meant to protect workers and do. Like I, I would argue that Eugene Debs does a good job at protecting workers in other parts of the country, but this is just somewhere that's so far gone that it's like America's third world. Like it's and it's not even just that um, they were they were so put upon because a lot of workers were put upon. The West Virginia miners were able to call upon. A lot of uh, resources, like the the community that they already had, in order to forge some sort of uh, a, 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 a class solidarity with one another. I look at like the beautiful what's this uh, Joe Kagan, the union organizer in this movie, and all the beautiful talk of uh, you know one big union and we're all workers together. It seems so alien to American society today to even imagine that. I mean, I believe. Yeah. That. But like, this the, like language this is a hundred, a yeah. hundred years ago, you know, like so much has happened over the last hundred years. I feel like the kind of strong communities that can allow you to take up arms and like against uh, the, 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 the mining companies and the deprivation uh, don't exist like they did a hundred years ago. Well, maybe if there were more black voices in the unions, women voices, then we would have, just kidding. I don't know. I was just being very liberal about my response to that. Um, <laughs> liberals like social peace. Liberals yeah. and liberals wrote right like half the city and half the history in this country. So yeah. that's and, why and, the, the yeah. Madawan story is not like the popular one in the U.S. Yeah, the Chris Cooper character, though, ends up being both the Warabli voice and the liberal voice, which does act. This is my one fault with the movie because because he's a pastiche, basically. Yeah. He's a pastiche between two different kinds of activists. And part of what he's saying, I mean, ultimately, they they side with uh, they have to, they side with guns because they have to. And I also like the fact that, by the way, if anyone's ever organizing, the first person who tells you to blow shit up is almost always a always fed. a cop. Yeah, <laughs> like, 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 it's just just yeah. like that, that's just a truth. You should just accept that. It's it's, um, it's it's interesting that in this movie, though, right? Like the Pomerades had just started a year before. And I know mm -hmm. you're a, a scholar of the old Pomerades, uh, Varn, but you know this kind of idea that like. No, like, which had been like going on within corporations for quite a bit, like, but you know, this Pinkerton idea, but like, we can kind of just put feds in there. Like, it seems like in this movie, like, there's one fed, which is really cute because I feel like, like, later on, right, like decades later, it would be like eight feds and two actual revolutionaries, and they'd be like, the eight feds are all like, we should blow something up. The other two people are like, well, I guess we should listen to democracy, but like, I don't really want to. Like, I feel like blowing something up is a bad idea. And there's yeah. eight people that don't know it. The rest of them are feds working for different agencies. Be like, no, we should blow something up. And the other guy's well, like, well, it's, it's, it's like when the when bots start talking to each other. Right? Yeah, and they, and they, it's like a feedback loop. Well, I mean, that really did happen with the Panthers, like in the seventies. Yeah, no, one hundred percent. It's real. Yeah, and um, the Panthers connect to this too because of that same idea of like you know community aid, mutual aid is happening within uh you know West Virginia communities because they had nothing else and. In the same way that, like in in certain you know block by block or neighborhood by neighborhood, uh, that that idea is going on within within the Panthers decades later, and I think that you know John Sales is probably definitely commenting on 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 the connections, right? Like, 
these connections are going on within the same uh, sphere. Yeah, I, I think about this all the time because, I, like, w- my my joke that I bring up now is like, who needs feds or who needs COINTELPRO when we have each other? Um, <laughs> and, um, because because we have like two decades of habits of giving into this stuff, um, where we don't know how to like. A, a vibrant movement will have arguments and fights and will be and will be aggressive and contentious. That that's undeniably true. But you keep it Especially in, if it's a leftist. Right, right. <laughs> but you keep it it well, it's true with rightist movements too, but it but you keep it in the movement. Like you keep it internal right. to yourself. Yes. Exactly. And um <laughs> and and that that they are ma- they managed to do that and then this is why that uh that uh, Baldwin Phelps guy does not end up breaking them up is because they are able to keep that contention. Cause there's contention even after they out the guy. I mean, the, yeah. the, the, the move to violence is something it takes them a long time to do. And, you know, ironically in this movie, the red is the person who opposes the violence the whole time because some weird story about Mennonites once. But he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a I might be a red, but I, I guess that's the name for me kind of guy. Which yeah, yeah, I do yeah. think I do think is accurate to some to some uh, organizers going from place to place that are just like I don't really know where I fall in this. I've been listening to a lot of Joe Rogan. He's been telling me one thing. And, you know. <laughs> to, to be fair though, the Mennonite story is an evocative one. Like it's definitely like you know that that's like a full stop moment of like oh interesting because there's. Because first of all, uh, if you're talking about collective action, that talks about people that you wouldn't expect to be participants in collective action can still participate in collective action in their ways, and they mm. have their own motivations and understanding that can be useful. And the other thing is that it helps illustrate, you know, helps illustrate like the larger the larger point of resistance and different types of resistance and and so, and, on and, so on. and the pacifism to World War One, which the uh, coalition, which I would say is a very similar coalition for the Vietnam war. Like, you know what I mean? Of, of people that are like reactionary, uh, you know, evangelicals are like in, in some ways, like, you know what I mean? But like also like the religious fervor in some sects of evangelicalism or uh, Quakers, which, you know, Nixon was, Nixon's mom was a Quaker. Like, you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. these different groups, people that might be um, socially reactionary or, uh, driven by religious fervor to be like, well, maybe we, maybe God doesn't want us to kill people in a different country, they can kind of ally up with uh, socialists or like, well, maybe there's a humanism in all of us that, you know, and, and Deb's kind of is a, is an interesting nexus point for that because I think mm. Deb's yeah. human, humanism is based around religion. And well, I and, and like, I'm glad we brought up the Mennonites because for my birthday one year, uh, oh my God, lost it's another DC. story. <laughs> <laughs> got lost in DC because we're all following the Mennonites thinking they knew where the museum was and they weren't even going to the museum to see George Lucas and Steven Spielberg's um, paintings. <laughs> that, that, that right. they bought. Well, with, uh, with that yeah, reference, we were just we seeing probably, the Rockwell exhibit. With that reference, you probably go to letterbox one liner. <laughs> oh yeah. The, the one thing I just want to say is, is as a, yeah. as a secular humanist, which I am by law of required to announce, uh, I think it's a good reminder <laughs> that, uh, you know, you can find political alliances with those with religiosity and it's another good reason why bill Maher is never a good spokesperson for atheism you know mm. or, or richard dawkins or you know don't get me started on any of that uh or get Renee don't get started. started doing a bill Maher impression where i go listen okay there's a god <laughs> and he wants you to listen to the laws He's, there's okay. No there's no just re- just won't, remember, <laughs> just remember that new atheism in its own way, shape, and form was was an, an adjunct to the imper- American imperialism in the two thousands. It yeah, arose well, in order to explain yeah. why they hate us in Afghanistan and Iraq. Yeah, well, you, yeah. You, but you look at you look at uh, like Sam Harris, right? Someone who oh uh, lord, why did I do this? Be, okay, <laughs> yep. Someone who's supposed to be like the uh, face of atheism throughout the new atheist movement. And all of a sudden it's like, well, all right. So because of, you know, you're a new, new atheist, you don't support Israel. Right. And he's like, well, actually, and it's like, <laughs> all right. So that's not. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, I mean, most we're, a better, of it's a we're a better democracy. So most of us are a farce full of like <laughs> fakers and opportunists uh, who have just as much religiosity towards lack of religiosity as anything else. What I like about secular humanism is the fact that it's like, Hey, Whatever you're into is whatever you're into, as long as it doesn't like harm and infringe upon the rights of others. Good on you. 
which I think mm. is a better like way of life ethos. But, which, uh, uh, you know, harm is also something that can be kind of a uh, elusive concept, I guess, because there are people, you know, libertarians are like, well, do no harm. And it's like, but like, you're literally you know trying to get serfs to exist and it's well, like, yeah, well that's not harm that's profit you know so no, I, I, is our book i i too am a I, I would say a secular humanist but like in a socialist way and not in like you know what i mean like i think that there is a all of these ideas can get co-opted and i think this movie bringing it back to this movie i think this Which movie we are does it well discussing. yes <laughs> does it well in understanding that like uh you know christianity itself religion itself can be co-opted whether to use it as like hey guys we're all in church and uh you know there's a there's a snitch among us or to be you, like you see both sides of it Th and that's what i think is cool you see both sides I, of it yeah, yeah. You, the pros which by the way i didn't remember the name of and i was trying to hint at it without but the prosperity gospel like the you know like you like god doesn't want you to unionize or like god jesus would want you to unionize and that's why we should do it like both ideas can exist simultaneously because this doctrine is not uh, you know, Marx didn't write it. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I like that you see both ends of it. Because yeah. at first, like, it feels like, when you watch this for the first time, it feels like you're only going to see, like, oh, right, here it is. Like, you know, the, the, basically they're going to go for the coal company's side of things. And, like, we get it. But then you then you get to see the turnaround when Radner, like, you know, again, 16 year old Will Oldham, very adequately is like, yo, I'm going rogue right now <laughs> in, in this church. It's happening. It's on. And, and it's pretty exciting and it lets you know that what you're going to be seeing is going to subvert your expectations a little bit and that's what makes this an evocative movie but we're not doing final thoughts we're doing my signature bit which is the yeah, one, box one, one last thing it's it's a reason that oh, i respected it. uh no it's a reason that i respected <laughs> kind of, the, bit. the last the last thing is the reason that i respected michael brooks version of i mean you know also he, he was my employer but <laughs> the michael brooks version of a left uh thought versus like the new atheist version of a left thought which is like um religion itself is evil or like well religion can be used for good or evil we should have a spiritual sense of our own humanity and you know an empathy for other people based around that if people do support that i feel like this movie yeah accurately express that but to letter totally box, shows that personally lines. yeah personally i don't feel like you need spiritualism for empathy but that's a completely separate discussion letterbox yeah, that's not what i was trying to say but no yeah. no no but i think it's an important discussion that i don't want to have right now uh every episode every episode of the show that we have i pull god is dead okay <laughs> Letterbox, a uh, place for films, a social media network that uh, allows uh, fans of movies and film to talk at, with, and to each other. Bottom-up democracy, no lords, no masters, no, uh, you know, there's, there's big names. Everyone gets their say. So what I do is I crawl through all of the reviews for the various movies that we cover. And I find the, you know, funny, pithy, hilarious, uh, interesting, notable one-liners. We bring them on the show. We talk about them. We react to them. And uh, it's a, it's a good time for all involved, if I, so I say. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. Chris Cooper and, and Matt Wan go on Chapo, which is great. <laughs> 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 wait, wait. It, it's Matt Wan, right? I'm Mate, Matt Wan. Mate Wan. Mate Wan. Mate Wan. Mate Wan. Fuck, how am I still fucking this up? Anyway, <laughs> that's uh, so You want to read it again? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah I don't want that to be an excerpt. Twitter. <clears throat> Chris Cooper and Mate Wan go on Chapo. Lord. five stars minus half a star for the kid who couldn't throw a baseball to save his life he was a good preacher though <laughs> solid chris okay. cooper no you can't just forego peaceful protests in favor of a small-scale violent rebellion it will only serve to maintain the cyclical oppression of the working class <laughs> david straythorn so anyway i started blasting <laughs> I, I this was my favorite one last night because I imagined because obviously that's like a the Danny DeVito quote. So yeah, I imagine yeah. David uh, Stratham's character played by Danny DeVito is like, so anyway, I started blasting. Like, yeah, the it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, this, this, this should be in that meme format by, by far. That's so hard there. Good, good Although one, the mayor looks more like Danny DeVito, I'm not going to lie. Yeah. yeah. Being, a, <laughs> being in a union is pretty fucking badass. Say oh, yeah, brother. Kick. Hell yeah, brother. Oh, yeah, this is a great one. This movie fucks. Big <laughs> <laughs> Cat Brady. I like how every movie you've done has had one of those. Like, every yeah. movie you've done, someone's like, this movie fucks. <laughs> <laughs>
This is one of my favorites. Comrade Sid could get it. <laughs> <It's Natalie. laughs> I think, so uh, much thirst posting on, on this site too. I love it. I think it's, people it's, in West Virginia agree with that statement. We love, we love to see it, folks. <laughs> Maybe Chris Cooper is a snack. Also, unions rule. Fiona Duvall, five stars. She's watching the trains right now. More like Will Youngum. Tommy Boy 420 with, with the <laughs> two facts stated. <laughs> I read somewhere that they're showing this in high school history class. I bet Chad fucking hates this movie, and that makes me happy. Fuck you, Chad. Yeah. I will say, they are not showing this movie in high school history classes. Even even in West Virginia, you know, from everyone talking about it, they're not showing this movie in high school history class. Maybe because because in Texas we got the uh, the Alamo where, where they won with uh you know with, with um uh, John Wayne uh, that that was part of our history class in Texas. So all right, but that's know. different than maybe, maybe they're showing so, it. so, so you a, know a unionization effort, and that's different than like a movie that kind of puts workers above capital. And also, I you know I watched the Alamo. Not that great, folks. No. <laughs> so you know, you know, actually, they do show this movie in high school. So it's just elite private schools, and I'm very serious ah, about that. <laughs> the kind of people that are never going to unionize. They're like exactly <laughs> the people we don't want to unionize. Actually, yeah. right, right. I mean, I'm just saying, like the people who are taught about American labor history are like the overlords of third world countries. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. They're going to use this information for ill. <laughs> yeah, they're using it as intel, basically. Right? <laughs> Being in the union is pretty fucking badass. Twice, two times we do this one. Spitalsky. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good one to end on. I like it. Yeah, yeah. Um. <laughs> so those are the letterbox one liners. Follow uh, Moving Extravaganza on Letterbox, which is. Uh, Forest, and then uh, myself, Conan Neutron, J uh, and D World is on there as well as long as many of our featured guests, uh, and of course, as always, uh, like subscribe the show on YouTube, uh, Twitch, do all the things that we are terrible at explaining. <laughs> and subscribe. Way, I Twitch. took the full. I and took subscribe. the full. I took that full thing where we were trying to desperately explain Discord on the last one. I just took the entire thing out of. Uh, oh, it, yeah, it's, of, it was. Yeah, Discord okay. is coming. That's all we need to say. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it is. But anyway, um, going to final thoughts, uh, Sean, starting with you. Um, final thoughts about this this film, what it teaches us, uh, you know, how we should look at it as, as socialists and, you know, and anything right. else. No, that's good. I, I think it's uh, it opens a lot of really interesting doors to understand what's uh, particular and unique about uh, the United States and uh, its labor history and how its labor history informs our labor presence. I think it also does the danger of, you know, there's some people who see um, maybe they're in like an industrial union right now who, who want to do like historical preservation or historical reenactment societies. I think we should also realize that the time and place for this, at least in the United States is kind of past. We can understand it as like the history, but um yeah, it's uh, we we can't just like um, reenact uh, Meta ones in uh, in 2022 and, and imagine do. that. Actually, yeah, they, they do. do. You know, unless there you live in one. unless you live in Meta one and that's your history. But, there's uh, uh no, there's a there's a Blair Mountain reenactment society, and uh, a big part of why they wanted to do the revolutionary left radio thing is that they wanted a pres like a presence of IWW actually at that because I think it's just you know a lot of petite bourgeois like. Uh, we're gonna go in there and, and pretend to be coal miners for that, that yeah. hour long video I mentioned that, that was made in uh Kentucky, you know, made in West Virginia about uh about everything that I thought was pretty good and, and actually had like the reconstruction of the court case. Um, they actually end with showing uh one of the uh the reenactments, which was just a lot of fun. The reenactments are great, I'm not talking shit about reenactments, <laughs> but I think that we should understand the history, we should treasure this movie because I think it's incredible. But uh, if if you want to like live a part of made one in your own life maybe that means organizing like a starbucks or or wherever it is that you maybe work. it means it's not just it for, shooting shooting the manager of your local starbucks. maybe it means that maybe it means that term <laughs> terms of service violation just mentioned right now but great movie you should check it out we'd like to welcome our new sponsor starbucks <laughs> <laughs> okay. i i on on, uh, on labor day i wrote um like kind of as like a a little bit sarcastically, but um, I wrote uh, uh, something. Something that was like um, the real meaning of Labor Day is to is to um, 
fucking uh, just kill just kill your local boss or whatever, like the <laughs> local like bourgeois person in your town. And the guy that owns the bar that I hang out at, like the dive bar, was like, "Oh, whoa, 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 maybe don't." Oh, I said, "I said uh, the way to really celebrate Labor Day is to uh, bayonet your local your local business owner." <laughs> and the the guy that, which by the way, the bar had an antifada sticker on the bathroom. Oh, door. no, shit. nice. Nice. <laughs> but uh, so for, so for us, is, it wants there. to bayonet your fans, basically, Sean. Is no, but it's someone that I know. Fine, that, like I'm, I'm for it. it's someone that I like. It's a guy I know, but I was like, you know, bayonet your local your local small business owner, and he's like, oh well, maybe maybe that's not what Devs wanted. And I was like, no, that's what. <laughs> <laughs> that's the mindset. <laughs> We have an antifada sticker on the bathroom door. You can't do that. Yeah, no. <laughs> that's like the uh, that's like the there, blood, but... of, blood above the door with the firstborn or something. I was yeah. going to say circle protection, you know, yeah. magic. <laughs> but Varn, final thoughts, final, 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 uh, you know, actions, final real strike actions on the stream. Um. One thing I would say is uh, joining a union is nothing like this now. As I say this as a union rep, um, sadly, um, if I brought a gun to my union meeting, I think uh, all shit would break loose. <laughs> um, uh, I, I would also say I think this movie is good. I I, I think uh, Harlan County, USA is actually a little more relevant to us now. Um but I, back I mean, I yeah. was, I was counting up labor movies <laughs> like made in the U.S. and I had like five, and I had to include Newsies. Like, so, <laughs> so, was Boxcar like, Bertha one of them? Yes, it was. Okay. So, <laughs> and, and John Bell talks about that. There's a long talk that he gives at the Lincoln Center about labor and film. And he's like, no, there aren't very many, and most of them that I found were Italian. So, like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's there, there's a lot of good European ones actually, and there's even some like crappy, like uh, Soviet realist ones. But like, this movie is one of the few we got, so you should see it. Um, it has a good Criterion release release if you're that kind of nerd. Um, so you can get plenty oh! of <laughs> Movie Day Extravaganza uh, brought to you by the Criterion Collection. <laughs> um, and the, uh, small, the small business owner that just got bayoneted. Yeah, this, <laughs> this couple of <laughs> The former <laughs> anti final listener. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so we can uh, collectivize that eventually, I suppose. Um, the, I think the movie. I think the movie is pretty good. I think it's very well shot. It's very well acted. Um, I would I would say though go read up on on the Battle of Blair Mountain because this is just the very beginning of it and it gets a lot wilder. Yeah. This isn't even I mean this isn't even really the beginning of it. This is kind of the story of the mythos and he doesn't portray it very well of of uh, Sid Hatfield who mm. becomes the martyr that kind of makes the Battle of Blair Mountain explode when he gets assassinated on the court steps. It gets a line in this movie. I like this movie a lot, but like you know it's it's interesting that like. The, the real battle comes from the fact that it gets national attention when, uh you know, he's assassinated on the court steps. This movie's like, by the way, after this two minute battle, he did get assassinated on the court steps. I, I, he, like, <laughs> yeah. And also the miners lose, by the way, just, yeah. just, uh, just FYI, which this movie does not let you see. So <laughs> they don't want you to know they don't. They, 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 know, the man is lost. The they win in the lost. end, and then they lose again by the <laughs> 1970s and 80s. <laughs> Losers, haters, the miners. <laughs> uh, Conan, final thoughts. Well, most relevant final thought is I fucked up when I was sending over the letterbox one-liners, and I forgot the one that's most relevant to this discussion, uh, which is this one. Imagine packed movie houses where audiences burst into rapturous applause at Mary McDonald wasting a union busting copper with a shotgun. That was pretty awesome. Yeah. Which, which it actually ties into uh, your whole thing with social media for us. So, like, I'm doubly sorry that I didn't proofread my uh, my, my work for a yeah, over. From, so from Molly Wingworm, which is a great name. Molly Ringworm, yes, is, is who did that. Only three and a half stars, though, which is whatever. Which is probably how Molly Ringwald uh, used her appearances now in John Hughes movies after that uh, relentless takedown of John Hughes movies that she wrote. <laughs> I remember it was Vanity Fair. 
or True. <laughs> so so first off let me just answer the fact that i think that um you know do, does it show everything in 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 the battle does it show everything in like the massacre no of course not and and the thing is it's, it's a movie it's a fucking movie guys it's a fucking movie like and, and like like i think that it wasn't a documentary I, I, I think about the like would you like to know more and starship troopers for that there's a lot of would you like to know more opportunities here and i'm so glad yeah. that, like why uh, was he called few clothes <laughs> right, yeah, why exactly where's if it was a prestige television series maybe there would be like a whole like episode on on that right and yeah, like, fantastic that story, don't do that why Some... he was called few i looked up online real quickly while we we're doing the show and i couldn't find anything why by the way they don't clothes. portray it very well but uh few clothes johnson was a um union organizer who uh was one of the most uh you know militant in in the area and was involved in this but um, they had a trial at one point where uh, it was something, there was something 11, I forget which, uh, which union it was, but he was one of the people that were like, that was actively, uh, involved in unions. So he wasn't just, you know, James Earl Jones kind of walking into the place yeah. and being like, I no, played no, Darth Vader, want me in your union? <laughs> no, no. Well, well, so here's, so here's the deal. And here's where I was going with all that is that I actually think that, um, this film is a great starting point for someone to do that manner of storytelling, which is much easier to do now. Like, look yeah. at like, uh, jo you know, John Bird, you know, like, uh, like, I, like the fact that they're able to like, <laughs> make like a prestige TV show out from that guy and like his 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 journey is fantastic. So this is an opportunity for someone, you know, a, a aspiring in the business that wants to do something cool and or important to tell that whole story. But I think this is a fantastic film. This is I mean, John Sales, he's even like like what's the worst thing is being like silver city or something okay well that was like a heavy-handed anti-bush thing and like we get it but like dude's pretty consistent honestly like he he's, he's... I, I, just to, just before it before you go into his cow no i want to i wanted to put this point in here somewhere so john yeah, I mean, sales when asked during that interview um and i don't think i included that clip they asked him hey could someone make a movie like this now and he says yeah yeah they could like it just it, it depends on you know <clears throat> whether um somebody like he's like the, the reason this movie didn't get um you know treated the way that i think it should is because we didn't do it with a studio we didn't do it you know we kind of yeah. made our own budget so like independent if somebody, financing and all that yeah yeah so he was like if a if a famous actor wanted to make a movie like this with a studio that actually tells this full story like they could it just has to be you know someone's passion project and they have to have the financing so uh, that's the first time I think that anyone's really said, no, yeah, this movie could be made today. <laughs> I, well, absolutely. And and to a certain degree, it almost it would be easier to get made today. And, and that's one of the yeah. reasons why I'm so glad that Criterion like did the restoral of it. Because the restoral is amazing. Like if you watch on the YouTube, like you won't even notice a difference. But like uh from from point A to point B, the restoral is incredible. Like and that's a good example of the service that, that they provide. But I mean, this is yeah, does it does it show everything? No, but it, it's a totally it, it's a brutal take on real history, and you get like a window into it. You don't get the entire story, and that's fine. It's not there until the entire story. But I think, as like Varn was saying, not a lot of labor movies out there. I throw sorry to bother you in there. Yeah, but yeah. Like, well, do you guys want to do a Harlan? Do you guys want to do a Harlan County USA episode? I love Harlan here? County USA. So yeah, I would I love to. Yeah, yeah, I was going to ask about the, uh, the yeah. I was going to ask that, about that, that is cover, like the Canadian channel. You know, Union Jesus over here, and, and it ends with the crucifixion. <laughs> I love That's how Carmen's perfect. final thought is like open discussion time because, like, we have our, our best ideas during my final thoughts. It's very, very powerful. <laughs> you know, you're just so inspired. I brainstorm, I Conan storm. You know what I mean? I storm the uh, Capitol sometimes, but not always. <laughs> yeah, exactly. When the conditions are right. Um, but, but I think, I, and again, just talking about the oppressive yoke of the, like the Stone Mountain Cool Corp, right? That like the company script, the horrible working conditions, et cetera, et cetera. It's all like laid out there. And it's not like done in exposition, like mm -hmm. in a way of like, you know, like, I, you know, the De Laurentiis Dune of like, here's 20 minutes of explaining what's going on before you actually see anything. Yeah. And I appreciate that. And I think that, again, sales does a really good job of, of showing that. And uh, props to Will Oldham, 16 year old Bonnie Prince Billy, his character like kicks Hell ass. Hell yes. He does. You know, totally kicks ass. And 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 to be fair, if they didn't just pick one battle, right? If they picked the entire Blair Mountain thing, they would have to do twenty minutes of exposition. Like you would have to because there's yeah. too much. There's too much stuff. In this, which is why. Uh, What's he doing and again, trilogy? Well, well, that's the thing. Is <laughs> nowadays long longer form storytelling would be more prestige television, and like you could stretch it out even to a couple seasons or something if you felt so inclined. <laughs> but like anyway, point of fact is that I think that for this coming out in 1987, this is bold. 
Like this is a bold yeah. movie to come out anytime, but during the like the middle of like you know, um, you know the in, in parts of Morning in America, like I ran Contra, like you know the the fact that like unions were everyone's more, really wanted to talk about like. Uh, you know which democrats are voting for reagan and like you know if bush you know if uh, um what, what's his face um on the tank is like is he a wimp or not and like that was that was like where the discussion was where it's like this has nothing to do with material aspects of people's lives uh bold thing to like basically show the founding of organized labor like when it was still was like can we do this i think we can okay let's go do it and the point yeah, isn't I mean, to but, show the wait, entire battle good. the point is to show yeah. the beginning the like the origin right and it so effectively does that. And it does it in a way that, again, I, th I think only John Sales could have made this movie, at least around that time. I think a bunch of people could have made it in the 90s, maybe even in the 2000s, but like. The 90s? Would it be a tech union? <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> no, no, but I, 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 think that, I think that the point you're making is 100% on point. Yeah. And I think that making it at the point where a union has just gotten crushed. And it's like, guys, yeah. like these, you, like. There needed yeah. to be that reminder, right? Because because if you because at this point in the '80s, only if you mention the word union, the next word is Jimmy Hoffa. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> right. Like, and that's all the people think about it, and 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 that had been so effectively framed as language that there really wasn't anything else in the conversation, you know. And and again, I'm saying this: I was ten or something when that when that when that was the case. So like, it wasn't like heavy on my mind. But again, my dad being a union dude, like I got to hear. If you were in a coal answer. mine, it would have been because you were ten and you were working in the coal mine now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> at that day and age, yeah. <laughs> But uh, no, I I 100 agree with those final thoughts, and I, and I think that it's bold to make it during this point for that very reason. Like, just being like, hey, do you remember like just because in the 80s it's like 60 years ago. Like, do you remember 60 years ago? Yeah. And like you know that people were literally just getting gunned down for even wanting to join a union, and now Reagan's just able to like just put his foot down and just crush the whole thing in one in one foul swoop like he doesn't even have to do the thing that uh you know that the government had to pretend to do during Blair Mountain which is like hey we're neutral arbiters and we're just here to like you know kind of mess around like you know we're gonna figure this out like no Reagan could just put his foot down and just go no more union for you and then the, the union like it's fucked up because I didn't hear this part of the story where they literally uh gave the union those benefits that they wanted like right. the, the year later Last thing, you work, they don't. That's all you get to know about the enemy. Mm -hmm. I wish people at <clears throat> Tesla would. <clears throat> anyway, I don't I know. Not to single out a single. <clears throat> Where's Mary McDonald and her shotgun when you need her, huh? <laughs> I, I think I think I've radicalized now after uh, you know having my Catherine Liu discussion yesterday about uh, don't look up. <laughs> where we've had that long and watching don't look up and then wanting nathan robinson to stick around to talk about don't look up and then he had to get back to work or whatever british mm. people do mm -hmm. i don't know <laughs> <laughs> the tea you gotta have some crumpets <laughs> hello no i said hello <laughs> nathan robinson i'm sorry please come back on <laughs> andy world final thoughts let's go <laughs> Yeah, um, Andy. I, yeah. I did kind of want to springboard a little bit like, like, you know, the 80s were like such an interesting transition, because uh, if you if you watched, uh, I, I did a rewatch of WKRP a few years ago, and there was actually a union episode in WKRP, hmm. um, which which, you know, maybe. Maybe Sean, you know, think about doing that for an episode of the Andy Fodder. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Um, that sounds fun. Yeah, they, yeah, they try to unionize. Um, and the thing is, too, is they actually captured like the, the boss um, position well. Like, You're like, telling other place. left podcasts to do movie episodes. No, you know TV episodes, man. <laughs> TV right, episodes. Well, so, so, like, bit. you know, because like they have a good relationship with the boss for the most part. And he's like, well, why, you know, he's like, kind of hurt. Like, why do you want to unionize? And, you know, it's, it's really good. But then, you know, that was, that was like, you know, 1980. And so by the, you know, by the time we get to the end of the eighties, we, we're, we're, um, you know, union's a dirty word. And, uh, somehow we got this movie and I'm glad we have this movie. Um, I, I like this. Uh, I, I do want to see, um, more union movies. Uh, uh and I want to see Varn's list, uh, because hmm. I can only think of uh boxcar Bertha. And then I want to copy. A, that's Varn's actually list. in all honesty Make episodes based on Barnes' entire list. And then you know what? We'll never have to figure out our own show again. <laughs> in all honesty, that would be a great use for Letterbox to to make a list like yeah. that. And then someone may already have because there's a lot of stuff out there. Yeah, yeah, I'll check it out afterwards. Um, 
I so the, the the last thing that I wanted to say based on this movie <laughs> is that obviously the Chris Cooper character is based on a, um someone that doesn't exist, right? Like, so the fact that they included the fact that uh you know this this lie that he had raped um that he had like raped or had people come in that raped a woman and that the union was gonna you know lead to a white woman who was just sitting around all day waiting for fucking trains to come and was upset that like uh you know the she lie was was <laughs> <laughs> she was shooting up in the train station bathroom waiting for trains to come and then being like eh but no but like the fact that they kind of use the Emmett Hill thing right and it's not a uh, it's not necessarily a, a black worker that it gets used on. Like it, it's kind of this the same thing where it's like, no, like union people are going to come in and just rape your white women. Like it's suddenly you're you're transitioning it from a racial thing, which it very much was. Like if civil rights happen within the South, like every woman will get impregnated by like every white woman will get impregnated by a black man. The fact that it's kind of used in this case as like no unions are coming. All right, well let's take that same line that we used. Uh, for Emmett Till or like that we use for these, you know, lynchings across the South and transition it to unions. Like I, I found that kind of profound. Like uh, it, the fact that like, it's, it's like, listen, if, if a union happens, every white woman will be pregnant and then you'll have a whole bunch of union people running around and, you know, <laughs> they're bad. And, and James Earl Jones is kind of sitting there listening to it and is, understandably in that context uh, upset by it and then like, like is, when he is, mentions the point that like if word gets out that a black man was shooting at white men mm. like yeah that would not be good <laughs> you Which know i don't think the real quote but i don't think the real few few clothes johnson would have cared about because they were running around and literally you know, holding up. Uh, he he was part of uh, an eleven, which was a sure. sure but we're talking film. about the fucking movie. Here, I know. Right? So like, let's but talk about a scene in the movie. Yeah, all right, great. <laughs> no, it's a hundred percent accurate though. Like, it's it's like, listen, black people shooting a white man would be put out there to everybody in the South and yeah. and in West Virginia as like, listen, like these are uppity people. Like they're they're going around, and you should just crush every black worker. Like it's yeah. divide, divide and conquer based on the American public, and to have realized that um, when when uh you know when Sid Hatfield got killed, right? Like the New York Times is is willing to sit there and be like, listen, it's good that he got killed, and these are like non-human entities. To think about how a, a black Sid Hatfield would have been treated by something like the New York Times is fucking insane. Mm -hmm. Like it, it is this difference in in uh, divide and conquer uh tactics that like the rest of the country would have probably sat there and been like oh no kill him like which they did for sid hatfield but like in a lot of like you know i mean like everything kind of failed for these workers but like adding a racial dynamic to it is accurate that's something that you know to be to be wary of so to have that actually covered in the movie with that too was was interesting so those, those are my final thoughts on it cool all yeah. right. <laughs> All right. Well, movie night extravaganza, hanging out. This is a big deviation from the rest of our movies, except the fact that it's made in 1987, which does gel with the rest of our uh, yeah. 80s fantasy movies. <laughs> if you want to hear a bunch of other movies that have nothing to do with this, tune in for the rest of the shows this month with all 80s fantasy movies. And I'm not kidding about that. We just, uh, aww. <laughs> this is Shug. Uh, <laughs> but that's it we do a lot of stuff here subscribe to the show if, if you're new well both of you are welcome on the podcast anytime yes. oh, um yeah. would love to cool pet, pet friendly movie show but i also say we just did labyrinth so like check that out i guess <laughs> <laughs>
They say in Harlan County there are no neutrals there. You'll either be a union man or a thug for J.H. Blair. Which side are you on? 